Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is a debate on motion number 10988 in the name of Fergus Ewing on accessible tourism. I would be grateful if members who wish to speak in this debate could press the request to speak buttons now, please. And I call on Fergus Ewing to speak to and move the motion, Minister, in around 14 minutes, please. Um, presiding officer, uh, today in the Chamber we are particularly grateful that the Scottish Parliament has provided its assistance to allow British Sign Language users to follow the debate in their language, that a palantypist is also providing text content to other visitors and the gallery is fully accessible to visitors using wheelchairs. I know that we are proud of the continued efforts, presiding officer, that the Parliament makes in order that we are accessible to all and with a range of facilities that are freely available to enhance the visitor experience and engagement. And of course, we are always keen to get feedback from those as to the sufficiency and quality of those provisions. I'm delighted to introduce this debate on accessible tourism. And this is, I believe, uh, presenting officer, the first occasion, at least in a government motion, where we have specifically debated this most important topic. It may therefore be helpful if I begin by setting out what we mean. There are 11 million disabled people living in the UK, 16% of the population. Only 2 million of them enjoy an annual holiday. Of this figure, let's bear in mind that only 4% of these people use a wheelchair, 2 million have sight impairments, and 9 million are registered deaf and hard of hearing. Looking at it on the global stage, there are 1.3 billion people, 1,300 million people with a disability, an emerging market the size of China. In 2009-10, the accessible tourism spend in Scotland was £325 million. By 2013, this spend had risen to £391 million, uh, an increase of £66 million. But the most significant aspect of these figures is the percentages of the overall spend. In 2009, it was 6% of the overall figure, but had risen to 14% by 2013. Now, once disabled people have found accommodation that suits their needs, they can be loyal customers returning year on year. And indeed, uh, it is estimated that around 70% of disabled people are able to travel. But because of lack of accessible accommodation and basic facilities, they do not. And disabled people tend not to travel alone. They are often accompanied by carers, by family and by friends. This increases occupancy and, from the perspective of the accommodation provider, brings in re extra revenue. Now, what does all this mean and signify, presiding officer? I think there are two clear conclusions. First of all, and most important of all, it's a matter of social responsibility to seek to enable and facilitate the enjoyment of a holiday or break for everyone for everyone, including people with a disability. But secondly, that by doing so, we create business opportunities for the whole sector and for the whole country. Uh, therefore, it's a matter on the one hand of social responsibility that disabled people, as with everyone else, have the opportunity and ability to enjoy a holiday, uh, but also that business opportunities are created by our so doing. Those, I believe, are the two key points which, upon which I hope we can all agree and take away from this debate today in order to build on the excellent progress being made in Scotland uh, on accessible tourism and to work together to achieve the enormous potential benefits both to disabled people and their family, friend and carers in adding the pleasure and enjoyment of a holiday to their lives and also to see the tourism sector lead the way in grabbing new opportunities there are in a world where more and more people are able to enjoy a holiday. Most or all of us in this chamber, I suspect, presiding officer, will enjoy a holiday each year, whether it's in Scotland, elsewhere in the UK or further afield. Perhaps too it's fair to say that we now and most of us here and many throughout the country take that for granted 
We take it for granted that we will enjoy a holiday. We are fortunate, but perhaps we just take that for granted, that we will enjoy a holiday, a break from the routine, a chance to get away from it all, a chance to relax and recharge the batteries. Will the minister take an intervention? Yes, I will. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Minister. I, I just wonder if, in considering uh, accessible holidays, he extends that to people who suffer degrees of ill health that mean they cannot get insurance for travel distance from home, and that therefore there is another segment, not simply disabled people, but people who are suffering ill health, who might equally benefit from the initiatives he's describing. Minister? Yes, I, I agree. People, particularly with, with impaired mobility, I think, who perhaps uh, uh, people of, uh, of many more years than they would like, uh, with impaired mobility have, I think, particular difficulties in uh, that respect. So I think Mr. Stevenson makes a perfectly valid point. As I've highlighted, the reality is that for the majority of disabled people, and it's actually around four out of five, four out of five disabled people do not enjoy a holiday like the rest of us. Four out of five. I think that's wrong, and I'm quite confident that all of us here want to work together to see what we can do to address that. And let me say that I'm very happy to accept the amendment from the Labour Party today and look forward to hearing Jenny Mara's contributions as with all members. Now, the reason why people with a disability may not choose to have a holiday, uh, even although they are physically able to have a holiday or a break of a certain type, are, I think, many and varied. And to understand them, we need to tackle them and to remove barriers to help people who have a disability to be able to have the confidence that they will enjoy a holiday, be catered for, and be afforded respect and courtesy. Now, firstly, the barriers are in part about facilities and buildings, yes, about physical access, about ramps, about access for wheelchairs, about the physical landscape, and that's recognized in planning law. The recent planning policy talked about adaptability as being one of the five principles involved, and that's right and proper. But perhaps, presiding officer, the, the, the really significant barriers may not always be so much physical barriers, but mental barriers. They're about people feeling, people with a disability, or indeed a impaired mobility, as Mr. Stevenson rightly points out, feeling that there would be a lack of an understanding or appreciation of their particular needs. Perhaps a nervousness that uh, people who would be serving them, whether at a hotel counter, a restaurant, or on a train or a bus, or in a number of other varieties, may be embarrassed about dealing with them, may not really have an understanding about how to assist somebody who is hard of hearing, or who is visually impaired, or who is in a wheelchair, or who has another form of disability. So, yes, I certainly will. Jenny Mara. Thank the Minister for giving way and I completely agree with him on the point about the mental barriers but on the physical barriers would he join with me in applauding the work of PAMIS in Dundee who support families who have children and young adults with profound and multiple disabilities and their campaign and um, their groundbreaking campaign for changing places uh, toilet facilities so that they can enjoy days out not even go as far as holidays but even a day out to the shopping centre and they can take their children and young people with them. Minister, I can reimburse some of your time. Uh, well, well, I'm not familiar with, with the particular facility, but it does sound like an excellent one, and, and uh, I certainly endorse the sentiments that Jenny Mara has expressed. So many people with a disability have told Visit Scotland that they just want to be treated with respect and consideration. Many people with a disability say that the reason they do not go on holiday may be the hassle or the potential embarrassment that they may face by doing so. These types of problems uh, and situations are ones that I think we can uh, deal with. And I will give way to Dennis Robertson. Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I congratulate the Minister for uh, moving on to talk about people with disabilities rather than disabled people? Because that in itself is a very positive step forward. Thank you. Minister. Well, I, I thank Dennis Robertson for his remarks, and I look forward particularly to hearing what 
Dennis has to say uh, in this debate, as I'm sure other members will be. At the heart of this approach is customer service, which embodies a can-do attitude and a willingness to understand the needs of those who have a disability. Um, we uh, have spent, presiding officer, a fair amount of time, Visit Scotland myself, in meeting people who have a disability to listen to their views. I've done so uh, in various events recently at the Botanic Gardens at the Royal Yacht Britannia. Uh, and taking the time to do that, and also at a, a subsequent meeting preparatory to this debate, where a range of people uh, who have a disability and a range of those who care for them or who are involved in assisting them put forward their views. And a minute was kept at that meeting, which uh, I, I think should be available for members. But the point is, in order to address this problem, we need to listen to the people involved most and find out what the problems are, particularly those that deter them from taking a holiday. Even the task of booking a holiday online can be more difficult because in addition to the tasks that we might do in booking a hotel online or, or a facility online, someone with a disability needs to make sure that whatever the service is being booked, accommodation, uh, travel uh, or other facilities, that their needs can be accommodated. That's an additional task that we do not have and perhaps the online journey is one which can be made simpler to cater for that with, uh, with information available at the start, not the end of online booking journeys, which I think we all know can be frustratingly long. What are we doing about this, presiding officer? Well, I, I do praise Visit Scotland, who've been driving this forward with a very practical training program, an online training program. And on the 23rd of June, I launched this online training program and we provided an amount of money to, towards it, £45,000, not a king's ransom, but this tool is a must for all staff and managers who work in hotels, B&Bs and restaurants, and everybody who serves the public. Anyone can access this online training tool. Everyone can understand what it means. It contains very practical information about what we need to do. For example, someone who is... Uh, uh, is visually impaired or is hard of hearing and has a guide dog or a hearing assistance dog, well, the dog likes to have some water to drink. So some hotels provide bowls of water for uh, those dogs who need the basics in life for a dog. Quite simple, but only once you think about it. And there's many other examples which this online training program will give of that sort. And therefore, I think, presiding officer, that seen in this light, there is a great deal of practical things that we can do. I'm pleased to say that 625 businesses have registered on this programme, with 67 having completed it. I particularly commend it to those who are involved in public transport and managers to make sure their staff are familiar with it. And, of course, if staff have the opportunity to gain training of this sort, they welcome it because they are able to provide the service that they all wish to provide. So this online training programme a fairly modest cost, I think, is doing well, but this is a chance further to promote it. Uh, I'm pleased that the Ryder Cup Europe has used this to train 40, 80 volunteers, uh, and I'm very pleased that in the Commonwealth Games there were considerable efforts uh, to provide the best possible facilities to those with a disability. Um, officer, I see that my time is uh, nearly coming to a close. And yet I have a further eight pages of text in front of me. Well, I can, Minister, give you a bit of time back, okay. but perhaps not that much. <laughs> oh, well. Well, I'll chance my arm then, uh, presiding officer. Uh, and uh, it does allow me, thank you, to talk about access statements. And access statements, one of these phrases that sounds rather like the phrase that I think Kevin Stewart on the local government committee is not here in the chamber this afternoon, but described as gobbledygook. Well, this is not gobbledygook, because you see, if you have a disability and you want to visit the Royal York Britannia, then you can go online and it has an access statement. It will tell you exactly what width the doors are to the toilets. It will tell you exactly what facilities are there for people with a disability. In other words, if you have a disability, an access statement tells you what you need to know. That's why access statements uh, 
are important. That's actually not what it says on that page, but, but there we are. Um, and to prove that it's not gobbledygook, research shows that 76% of consumers say that access statements positively influence their decision to travel. I mean, for the rest of us, if we want to know that uh, there is a swimming pool in a facility, then we just look and see, and there it is. But if you have particular needs, you need to see that those particular needs are catered for, and access statements do just that. So, thank you for that, Presiding Officer. Uh, moving to a close, could I just say how pleased I am to have had the opportunity to listen to so many people with a disability that have helped me learn just a little bit more about their predicament, uh, to work with, uh, uh, with uh, Visit Scotland in particular, who have uh, led the way. Uh, I am engaging with counterparts in Brussels next week, uh, if I get slipped that is, uh, in order to have discussions with European colleagues and to talk about what we're doing in Scotland. I work with uh, Visit Scotland and the Scottish Tourism Alliance and their Chief Executive Mark Crotho is witnessing this debate today. So I very much look forward this afternoon to having a constructive, positive and useful debate and discussion with members across all parties in the Chamber and together see what more we can do for people with a disability to enjoy something that we take for granted and something that we take as of right. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Many thanks. And I now call on Jenny Mara to speak to and move Amendment 10988.1. Ms Mara, around 10 minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I thank the Minister for bringing forward the Scottish Government's uh, debate this afternoon on this very important topic, uh, accessible tourism. And like him, I would like to start by recognising the fact that the, the BSL interpretation is going on in the, the public gallery this afternoon. Uh, I chair the uh, Parliament's cross-party group on deafness and we have had a flurry of activity just recently actually myself and Dennis Robertson the, the SNP member of that group campaigning for BSL interpretation to actually be available during the televised referendum debates um, we had a bit of success with that but I think have still to persuade some of our mainstream broadcasters uh, that this, this is an accessibility issue that they need to, to take seriously so I thank the Minister for highlighting that and say that work is, is ongoing cross-party on these issues. I think presiding officer today seems like a very timely opportunity to discuss accessible tourism because with the Commonwealth Games just behind us and the Ryder Cup teeing off tomorrow, I think, uh, tourism has been a real focus for Scotland uh, this year. And I, I felt very keenly over the last few weeks, especially a destination for political tourists uh, this last few weeks as well. Now, tourism presiding officer in Scotland not only contributes uh, towards our economy, I think it's worth reflecting that it really reflects the values of our community. Because accessible tourism means opening doors to every visitor and treating them as equal no matter what. It is to be inclusive, to welcome, to teach and to learn from others. And such inclusiveness is only possible by exercising equality in our communities. And we saw the glory of equality this summer, presiding officer, when for the first time in Commonwealth Games history, para sports were counted towards the main medal table. And we saw the glory of equality when venues such as the Chris Hoy Velodrome were built from the ground up with accessibility as a primary planning concern right from the word go. And we saw the glory of equality when our biggest city in Scotland, Glasgow, opened its arms and welcomed thousands of visitors with equal warmth, equal care and equal consideration, making them feel truly part of the Commonwealth Games. How a community takes its values of equality and extends them to accommodate all visitors I think speaks volumes about its social and cultural outlook. So what does accessible tourism mean to Scotland? I think it means the ability for all to visit and enjoy our country freely. For mothers like Samantha Buck, it means having access to disabled toilet facilities, 
to be able to take her son Alfie, affected by multiple and profound learning disabilities, on days out in Scotland. And Samantha Buck is supported in part by the Dundee-based organisation PAMIS, who I mentioned to the Minister in his opening remarks. And they run campaigns like Changing Places, which many MSPs in this chamber will be aware of. That campaign aims to ensure changing facilities in public toilets for over 230,000 severely disabled people, including those with profound and multiple learning disabilities. And that accessible tourism means that those with permanent disabilities, parents with young children, are able to access those toilet facilities that they need to experience an enjoyable day out or a holiday. Accessible tourism encapsulates a vision of a community that fights for equality. And alongside this, I think the sustainable value it adds to our economy is immense. Accessible tourism has this year been valued at more than 370 million to the Scottish economy. Now, this is an increase of 37 million since 2009. And according to recent research carried out by the European Commission, the UK was among the top three contributors to the European economy when it came to accessible tourism, contributing 86 million euros and 1.7 million jobs to the market, 20% of the EU total. And there is even more room for growth, as the Minister said. If European destinations were fully accessible, this demand could increase by up to 44% a year, which would result in an additional 3.4 million jobs. And these opportunities were only underlined by the fact that the Minister gave us in his opening remarks that four out of five disabled people do not yet enjoy a holiday. So it's only it's for their benefit, but it's also real benefits to the economy to make that happen as well. Better accessibility, of course, means higher occupancy rates in our hotels and loyal customers who keep returning. Accessible tourism reflects true equality and long-term sustainable trade. And I think tourism has a fundamental role to play in job creation and economic growth over the next decade. Now, we applaud in our amendment today those in the Accessible Tourism Project who are fighting to give disabled people a basic right to, to enjoy holidaying like all others and to remove the fear of the unknown for visitors to our cities, towns and villages and to show that we are ready to give every visitor a welcome as warm as the last. So I would like to move the amendment at this point, presiding officer, and thank the government for their indication that they will be supporting the Labour amendment this afternoon. Now, I think efforts must be made to show the mutual benefits businesses and consumers gain from a strong, accessible tourism industry. And this ideal has been brought forward with particular strength during the Commonwealth Games this summer. And disabled sports stars and campaigners have praised the Games, pointing to the impressive levels of access and the successful integration of mainstream and para-sports events. And two of the most common barriers facing visitors with access needs, poor customer service and a lack of accurate information, were tackled head-on through training, innovative online tools and clear communication between staff and visitors. Now, Ewan MacDonald, is a man with motor neuron disease who set up a popular disability access review website called Ewan's Guide when he became wheelchair bound as a result of MND. Now Ewan praised not only the facilities at the Commonwealth Games but the communication surrounding those facilities as outstanding. And for you, an accessible tourism means eliminating the element of the unknown, as the minister said, allowing him to enjoy sporting and music venues without fear of being turned away or unable to enter. Now, varying disabilities call for varied solutions. And the Commonwealth Games paved the way for this, an achievement that many across the globe can undoubtedly learn from at future events. But it's important to reflect on some of the barriers and challenges the Games highlighted and how we can hope to move past them in the future. Because while the hydro was lauded for its wheelchair accessible options, 
Those with scooters or difficulty walking found additional barriers, limited seating availability in food courts and long additional distances to walk around the venue. The Independent Living in Scotland project found events to be accessible, but transport around Glasgow not as good as usual. And accessible transport has been highlighted specifically in our capital city recently. Members will have witnessed it themselves. The recent changes to stop taxi access to the capital's Waverley station has a significant impact on accessible tourism. And I understand that Network Rail took this decision at very short notice and without consultation. And the station has now become even more inaccessible for people with a disability. Inclusion Scotland have said that this is inexcusable, that this is how many disabled visitors to Scotland's capital city are welcomed. And I wonder perhaps if that is something from today's debate that the Minister may be able to explore with Network Rail. I think that is a clear signal, presiding officer, that accessibility must be central to all planning and management decisions around our transport networks in Scotland. Presiding officer, the spirit of the Commonwealth Games came in the form of teamwork and possibility. I think we need to take that and ensure that businesses and services become even more accessible to visitors. We need to support groups such as PAMIS and Ewan's Guide, just two examples, excellent examples, of many people out there campaigning for more accessible facilities and a boost in tourism. While the new £45,000 online training programme set up by the government has helped Scotland's tourist facilities become more accessible, we need to constantly be updating our approach and more needs to be done to make sure that we have a better understanding of the requirements and realise this economic boost. That understanding needs to translate into long-lasting and sustainable action. Presiding officer, I welcome this debate this afternoon. Um, I'm sure it will be a very interesting debate and I look forward to hearing the other speakers. And I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Nanette Millen with around seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to be taking part in this important debate this afternoon, which comes as a, as a refreshing return to normality after so many weeks of intense focus on constitutional matters. We all know that tourism is a major contributor to Scotland's economy, but I confess I wasn't aware till preparing for this debate of the very considerable contribution of accessible tourism within that. This amounted to more than £325 million as far back as 2009, and that's a figure which has the potential to grow very significantly with improved infrastructure, services and attitudes towards travellers with special access needs. Because the accessible tourism market encompasses not only people with permanent disabilities, but also families with young children and an increasing number of senior travellers. The ongoing accessible tourism project in which Capability Scotland is a key partner with Visit Scotland and the Scottish Government is doing very important work in identifying the barriers faced by holiday makers in, with disabilities in Scotland and in raising awareness with the within the tourism industry of the business benefits of accessible tourism. There's still a long way to go if Scotland is to become the, the most accessible tourist destination in Europe. Um, but the recognition of training needs within tourism businesses and the efforts being made to ensure that the industry recognises the all-round benefits to businesses and their customers from maximising accessibility are significant steps in the right direction. I too must just briefly mention this summer's Commonwealth Games, which featured para, para sports alongside all the others and which was the most disabled friendly games in its history. Glasgow very ably rose to the challenge of accessibility for more than 350 athletes with disabilities and over 10,000 spectators with specific access needs over the two weeks of the Games. And this, possibly more than anything else, I think, has helped to raise awareness with the Scottish public of the general need for accessible tourism in Scotland. The consultation events with people who have disabilities and with impairment groups carried out as part of the Accessible Tourism Project highlighted a number of common themes, such as the need for accurate and up-to-date information on how accessible venues actually are, and the often poor customer service and staff attitudes, probably due to inadequate training on disability equality and awareness. 
We've had an excellent briefing paper from ScotRail highlighting their significant and continuing efforts to improve their customers' experience, and also one from Inclusion Scotland drawing our attention to their concerns about Network Rail's recent decision to ban vehicles from Waverley Station. I must say I share their concerns, and as someone still recovering from hip replacement surgery, I personally have found the distance of taxi ranks from the central hub of the station quite testing. And this must be the case for many people, even though there are accessible lifts for those who need them. And I endorse Jenny Mara's plea to the Minister to raise this with Network Rail. Presenting officer, ahead of this debate, I was invited along to see an excellent facility in my own region. And I want to focus the rest of my, my speech on my experience there. Crathy Opportunity Holidays was developed around 10 years ago as a self-catering holiday destination suitable for people with disabilities and their families. Funded entirely as a charity, Crathy Holidays, situated right next to Balmoral Castle in the beautiful scenery of Upper Deeside, was the brainchild of the wife of the then minister of Crathy Kirk. A trained social worker, she was acutely aware of the lack of suitable accommodation in the area for tourists with access and other problems and saw the dilapidated stable block next to the manse as ripe for development into a disabled-friendly venue. A year or so of intensive fundraising resulted in a courtyard development of high-quality units equipped to cater for many differing needs. For example, they have state-of-the-art wet rooms, hoists, combined wash basins and mirrors which raise and lower as a unit, wheelchair-accessible kitchen worktops and cookers, and many other living aids for people with varying disabilities. Other specialist equipment can be obtained as required, but there are sometimes difficulties here. I was told that equipment which comes from the NHS is readily available, but on occasion, that which comes via the Council's social work department is withheld for health and safety reasons, even though the client is well versed in the use of such equipment. Hopefully this sort of difficulty will be resolved as we go ahead with the integration of health and social care. Another problem faced by staff at Crathy Holidays is the difficulty in accessing carers locally to help with getting clients dressed or ready for bed, for example. And I wonder if this could be solved by training social science or nursing students to do this as a work placement during their course. It's a, it's a suggestion which I intend to explore with the university in Aberdeen. Earlier this year, a new lounge where visitors can meet together socially, have computer access or play games or whatever, was formally opened by the Duchess of Cornwall during one of her frequent visits to her home in nearby Burke Hall. And, and in this room, I met some of the holidaymakers who were staying in the complex. They were full of praise for the accommodation, facilities and equipment, and for the small number of very dedicated staff who run the enterprise, ensuring the, their comfort and making them feel at home throughout their stay. And they all stressed that Crathy holidays are indeed holidays, not to be confused with respite care. One lady comes regularly from the south of England for her holiday at Crathy. Her family stay there too, and there are children's recreational facilities so that all generations of the family can have a real family holiday together. Another couple come frequently from the central belt. The lady has severe physical disabilities and advanced dementia, and her husband really appreciates being able to have a holiday with his wife in appropriate accommodation and beautiful surroundings with helpful, understanding staff around him. His experience in the area beyond Crathy has not been without difficulty, however, particularly in accessing suitable toilet facilities. His wife needs a special hoist, and the only toilets with such equipment are in Aberdeen, some 40 miles away. One is in a sports complex and only available when the, the, when the complex is open, and the other is in Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, where there was no receptionist to give directions and no one else had heard of it. For disabled visitors without such highly specialised needs, Crathy Holidays has radar keys which they can give to residents to allow them access to locked facilities when they're out and about. Of course, only a few tourists can be accommodated at any one time at Crathy, but it is an excellent venue giving people with disabilities and their families a proper holiday, and it is very worthy of replication in other tourist areas. Presiding officer, this debate has opened my eyes to many of the problems encountered by tourists who require special and accessible facilities. And I'm glad that individual tourism businesses are increasingly becoming aware of the more specific needs of many of their customers and hopefully training their staff to treat all their clients with respect and understanding. To be the most accessible tourist destination in Europe is a very worthy aspiration and I hope we can achieve it. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and we will be supporting the Labour Amendment.
Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate. Speeches of around six minutes, please, although I do have a little bit of time in hand at this stage. I call Graham Day to be followed by Mark Griffin. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, expenditure by tourists with a disability in Scotland last year totalled almost £400 million, pounds, and in financial terms, that makes it an important contributor to the tourism sector and, indeed, the wider economy. But I think we would all of us agree that this is not a subject matter to be considered largely in terms of pounds and pence. Regardless of the financial value of accessible tourism, as the Minister indicated, it is incumbent upon all of us to render, at least try and render, Scotland not only as accessible as possible to our visitors to our country, but just as importantly, our own people seeking to explore what Scotland has to offer, because it is the right thing to do. Whilst appreciating the practical challenges, some of which simply cannot be overcome, we have to make uh, visiting our attractions close to the experience for those of, with disabilities as it is for able-bodied amongst us. Um, now, there is no denying that significant progress has been made in this regard. In recent years, many tourism destinations have become more wheelchair friendly with the installations of dis uh, disabled toilets and ramps and a general attitudinal change. However, this better understanding of the needs of wheelchair users unfortunately appears not to be being accompanied by making tourism destinations suitable for people with other disabilities, at least not to the same degree. While it is welcome that so many organisations and companies are making their attractions, museums, hotels, wheelchair accessible, there needs to be more done to make these sites accommodating to say the hearing impaired. Presiding officer, since being elected, I have struck up a good working relationship with Tayside Deaf Links in Dundee, and through that gained an, an understanding of some of the everyday avoidable difficulties that deaf people encounter. And preparing for this debate on a recent visit to the Deaf Hub, I raised the subject of accessing tourism facilities um, with some of the folk there. The general view was that their needs are far less understood than those uh, others whose uh, disabilities are more obvious, harsh, perhaps, but it is worth noting that only 29 per cent of people with a disability have a disability that is immediately visible. And if deaf people feel they are not being catered for, then that must give us food for thought. Ahead of today, I also asked some leading heritage tourism attractions in Tayside how they catered for visitors with a hearing impairment, or indeed who are profoundly deaf. Historic Scotland run at Arbroath Abbey. Uh, there they proactively advertise a, a full functional hearing loop, but that is as far as they go. The needs of the deaf community are even less well catered for at Glam's Castle. And I mention that particular attraction to highlight the issue rather than for particular criticism. In response to my querying what provision they had for deaf visitors, I was told that deaf people are catered for in the same way as wheelchair users, who, of course, could not manage up and down the stairs of an ancient building. They are provided with an excellent visual presentation, complemented by subtitles. But, of course, many deaf people cannot read English. Sign language is how they communicate. Now, Glam's Castle will not switched on to that. They are now and hopefully will see change because we, need, we absolutely need to better consider the requirements of all sectors of our community when it comes to tourism. Isn't it bizarre that many leading museum and historic sites provide headsets with an audio tour, usually available in multiple languages, yet for the hearing impaired from the domestic or wider English-speaking market, there is nothing like as much attention paid to their needs? And let's remember, one in six of our population are reckoned to be suffering from some degree of hearing loss, and that figure is set to increase to one in five by 2031 as people begin to encounter hearing issues at a younger age. Now, there are exemplars. The Royal Yacht Britannia, mentioned by the Minister, uh, offers BSL tablet tours with induction loops installed throughout the ship. Visitor services here in the Scottish Parliament, which, apart from the important work done within the building, is a significant tourism attraction, will provide BSL signed tours. It is happening uh, today in the gallery. M members may have noticed a, a signer in the gallery here uh, on Tuesday relaying the entire debate to members of the public. Uh, and uh, on request, this service can also be made available for FMQs. Continuing with the positive. I sh Absolutely. Dennis Robertson. I'm very grateful to the member for taking a brief intervention uh, because he highlighted the fact that the BSL is here this afternoon as well. Kind of perhaps, and this is a gentle, respectful uh, uh, note to the member, um, speed speech is very difficult for someone with BSL to keep up with. <laughs> Graham D. I am suitably chastised, presiding officer. Um, continuing with the positive, I think I should also mention, and at a reasonable pace, Dundee Contemporary Arts Centre. That, that centre provides signed tours of new ex exhibitions as free events. Uh, President Officer, I, I understand that BSL signed tours carry a cost. Qualified signers, I think, charge up to £60 an hour. 
But if we are to become a truly inclusive country, then we need to bite the bullet here. And we need to recognise that it's not only at the end destination that those with a hearing disability struggle at. Deaf people often find it hard even to make travel and hotel arrangements. If they have no access to the internet or struggle to read English as BSL is their first language, online booking is not possible. Making a telephone booking obviously isn't possible either. Usually those who are deaf or hard of hearing will turn to someone else to book uh, on their behalf. Uh, but the manager of Tayside Deaf Links, Alana Trusty, tells me that she recently tried booking train tickets on behalf of a group of deaf ladies and encountered problems using one of those debit cards owing to data protection issues and security issues. Now, obviously, we understand the need for safeguards, but we also need to think about flexibility here. And of course, even if you succeed in booking travel uh, as a deaf person, there are other issues that arise. Uh, as we all know, platform or gate changes and delays are usually announced over a tannoy system, often without accompanying visual indications of such changes, which in any case a deaf person might not be able to understand. To be fair to First ScotRail, they have been supporting a voluntary staff programme, training employees in sign language since 2006, but the experience of, of deaf or hard of uh, hearing uh, travellers suggests there is still much to be done. In order for Scotland to justifiably boast that it offers accessible tourism, much more must be done for all disabilities and meeting the needs of those disabilities. As I acknowledge, there are costs involved, presiding officer, but these will be met as more and more deaf people from within Scotland and elsewhere become better able to visit our major attractions. And in any case, as I noted at the beginning of my contribution, this has to be about more than pounds and pence. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Mark Griffin to be followed by Nigel Dawn. Thank you, President Officer. Before I start, I welcome the, the fact that we have BSL translation for the debate today and look forward to that becoming uh, the norm rather than uh, the exception and encourage members to support my own British Sign Language Scotland Bill, which is on our way to your office soon. Um, aside from that, I think it is important, um, as set out in the motion, that we do recognise the important contribution to the Scottish economy that accessible tourism makes, that disabled people should be able to enjoy a holiday or a break or, or just participate in general leisure activities that we take for granted that Jenny Mara did point out. But we should also recognise the importance of respite for family members in a caring role. We should remember that while caring isn't a burden, that it can be challenging and that the need for respite is definitely there, making accessible tourism a must for both sides of that relationship. In that context, we should acknowledge the work that has been undertaken and the progress being made by Visit Scotland, but recognise that a lot of the work which has to be done um, by government is actually making sure the private sector are aware of the tremendous opportunities that are out there, the work that they need to do in adapting infrastructure or just making information from the public sector more easily accessible to the public or travel companies, as the, the Minister made that, that point. It, it's been said that the accessible tourism sector has the potential to bring in hundreds of millions of pounds per year to the Scottish economy, but what exactly are we doing to bring that business into Scotland? A simple example would be the adverts which go out across the UK and the world from Visit Scotland. Why is there never an older person in the advert? Nobody with a, a walking stick, a wheelchair, a person with a guide dog um, in those adverts. And I know that I'm in danger of typecasting and picking out visible disabilities here, but does the world actually know through our high-profile visible advertising that Scotland is open to accessible tourism? What can we learn from the countries who really do this well? From conversations I've had, I'm told that the world leaders in this field are Australia and Spain. What, what's the minister able to tell us about any dialogue his department has had um, with the tourism sectors in these high-performing countries? And I acknowledge that the minister um, anticipates perhaps meeting some of these representatives in Brussels in the near future. Is the minister also able to tell us if there are any plans to dedicate a senior member of staff to this sector with such high potential for growth and benefits to the, to the economy within Visit Scotland? I might be wrong, but I understand there is an individual member of staff within Visit Scotland who has that responsibility 
um, for accessible tourism, but they also have responsibilities in, in other areas too. Right, there's an excellent company who operate in Cumbernauld called Altogether Travel. They, they act as a, a travel agent for supported holidays and travel. They provide a service that is unique in Scotland in that they are registered with the Care Commission and can provide a complete package for someone who wants to go on holiday here or abroad. And just this month, they have customers enjoying holidays in Malta and Spain, and I'm sure I'm not the only one who's jealous of that, given the long referendum campaign we've just come through. As I've said, they provide the complete package for anyone who would like a supported holiday. Altogether Travel offers care and support to older adults, individuals with physical and learning disabilities, individuals with dementia, and people experiencing mental health issues and sensory impairment. They give the freedom to choose when and where someone can travel and what level of support they require. It means that people, that people can enjoy a break on their own with friends or family, or they even have staff who act as holiday companions to provide support as and when required, which is why they're registered with the Care Commission. Now, they, they provide that service to anyone living in Scotland, but that's just one side of their business. They are providing that service, that worldwide network of contacts and planning for someone who wants to go on holiday from Scotland and spend their money elsewhere. The other side of the business that they want to develop is in attracting tourists into Scotland so that they can provide that same service that they offer, they offer to Scottish people, to everyone else in the world, to expand their business and get people from outside Scotland coming here and spending that money to raise that, to, to help to achieve and realise that potential figure of hundreds of millions of pounds coming into the Scottish economy. They, they're already getting inquiries from people in other parts of the UK and they're doing what they can to provide that service, but it is difficult. Business and the to, businesses in the tourism, tourism sector here really need to adapt to that market. Uh, we know how big that market is. We know how we know it's out there, and particularly with a population that's living longer and all that entails. Business need to be upfront about what they have capacity for and what they need to do to adapt to cater to that market. If altogether travel and other supported or accessible travel agents want to grow capacity to take on clients and customers from outside Scotland and contribute more to the Scottish economy, then they'll have to be supported by the tourism sector, taking action on accessibility, advertising and communication. I think that has started um, with the Minister and Visit, Visit Scotland showing that leadership. Um, I'd like to hear the Minister perhaps address some of the points that have been made and have come directly from business involved in that sector and how we take that forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call Nigel Dawn to be followed by Patricia Ferguson. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I have to say this is a fascinating debate, particularly coming where it does, as has previously been mentioned, after the, uh, the kerfuffle of the previous few weeks. I'm grateful to Jenny Mara in particular for raising PAMIS and to many colleagues who have already mentioned BSL, uh, partly because that means I don't need to, um, but partly because it shows how multifaceted this whole issue is. Um, tourism is clearly a, a, a national opportunity, as the Minister has pointed out, but I have to say that I agree with him. It's also a social responsibility for ourselves. There is absolutely no conceivable reason why those who are disadvantaged within our society should not be able to travel around it and enjoy simply being out and about, never mind the holidays that we do, because the facilities are not there and we must make sure the facilities are there. And for those who do want to worry about the numbers and the money, I would point out that not only is it good for the businesses that they visit, but it's also good for our health services and all the other facilities which we have to provide for those who are stuck at home, because actually they do, quite simply, cost us money in consequence of them being there. Uh, and the ability to get out and about and enjoy life is actually very good for the collective bank balance as well as, of course, for the individuals concerned. Um, 
when one starts to look at, at accessibility, it all becomes very local. Uh, and I took the opportunities, I'm sure other members have, of, of looking around my constituency and seeing what I could learn and, and where the access was good and where the access was not so good. Now, I shall deal gently with some of the organizations that I, I, I found. But a couple of things do emerge, uh, presiding officer. Um, the first one was that I, I, I came across the Caledonian Railway, which of course runs from my home city of, of, of Brekin off towards Montrose. Uh, and it is accessible for wheelchairs, uh, ramped access to the railways. And then I found myself wondering whether when you're on a steam railway, you really need to be able to have a hearing loop. I have a suspicion that's one of the experiences in life where you don't need to hear it at all. I suspect you can feel it and you know exactly what's going on. But then I also got to uh, another, another the extreme. I got to Dunotta Castle just outside Stonehaven, and I welcome some youngsters from that part of the world to the gallery. Um, and I thought to myself, you know, Dunotta Castle is there precisely because it is inaccessible. And I have a sneaking suspicion that we need to be just a little bit careful in our discussion about access, just to make sure that we don't go overboard and suggest that everything should be immediately accessible to absolutely everybody. Um, I'm not quite sure how you're ever going to get wheelchair access to Donata Castle. It might be wiser not to try. I do, however, want to come back as some have to the railways. Uh, and again, I'm grateful to Jenny Mara for picking up on the issue of access to, to Waverley Station, which I think has been suggested might have more to do with security, but it is absolutely a problem that we need to solve, and I do add my voice to that argument. But I've been pursuing with the railway companies um, why it is that those who are very blind, um, and those in particular who are deaf-blind, uh, should not be able to be accompanied by a companion who travels free. If they had a guide dog, it's undoubtedly the case, and I have checked with our resident guide dog, that um, Mr. Q travels free. But if I required a companion to come with me, that companion would not travel free, unless they had their own reasons for traveling free and appropriate card. They might get a discount depending on which local authority they're resident in, and they might also get a substantial discount if they had an appropriate card by dint of age or other discounts. But I am stuck with the problem that the cost of traveling, of occupying a seat on a train which is out of commuter times is for all practical purposes zero. One of the things they do teach you at the Harvest Business School is that most business costs are fixed costs. And if that seat would otherwise be empty, the cost to the railways of you occupying it is in fact zero. So it does seem to me that there is a very clear case for asking the railway operators to say, surely someone with severe disabilities who needs a companion to get out should be able to take that companion free. Now, I've asked that question. And the train operator's response, and I'm going to quote, train operating companies are not in a position to allow free travel for companions, as there would be a financial cost attached, sorry, a financial cost attached to this that the train operating companies would not be in a position to meet. There are a number of off-peak services that are particularly busy. And there is almost always a value associated with the seat on the train, whether it be the cost of running or cleaning that train or the staff employed to ensure the train reaches its destination. I quote that because I want to quote it back to them. Those are all totally fixed costs. I do, however, accept that there may be some off-peak trains that are particularly busy and there is a real cost attached to a seat, but it seems to me they're pretty few and far between. I don't want to argue with them about their railways because they know their systems, they know which ones are busy, and they know what's going on. But I do want to argue with them that the cost attached to letting a companion to someone who's blind or deafblind is, frankly, from my point of view, pretty much zero. And I think this is something that they should be able to deal with. I will continue to challenge that with them. I'm doing so in parliamentary time quite deliberately. I'm conscious that Fergus Ewing is not the relevant minister, so I'm not laying at him at this this at his door, but I will be taking it to the Transport Minister, and I think this is just part of the argument. This is something we need to address, whether these folk are coming from far or near. It seems to me the deaf, blind, and those with severe difficulties in, in seeing should be able to take a companion free on an off-peak train, and I think that's an issue which we ought to pursue. Thank you.
Many thanks. And I now call Patricia Ferguson to be followed by Chick Brodie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I add my voice to other, that of others in welcoming the BSL interpretation that is going on this afternoon to make this debate about accessible tourism as accessible in itself as it can be. Of course, as we know, tourism is one of our biggest and most important industries and is a part of our economy that can continue to grow and develop over the coming years. But this debate shouldn't be about the contribution tourism and particularly accessible tourism can make to the economy. Because tourism is about more than money. It's also about that most important and valuable commodity, time. And in particular, it is about that memorable weekend, or if we're lucky, two or more weeks when we join family or friends for some relaxation, doing the things we enjoy most and recharging our batteries. We all need to have a break now and again. And the 11 million people in this country with a disability are no different, or at least they shouldn't be. But for many people with a disability, the idea of going on holiday can be a daunting one because the challenges they face in everyday life don't go away just because they're on holiday. Now, I read recently about a project in Fife, which I believe Mr Ewing visited, which is the brainchild of David and Moira Henderson of Cooper. They're building a self-catering facility for disabled holidaymakers, where even the most severely disabled can be accommodated and where on-site care can be an option if required. Now, the Hendersons are to be congratulated on their idea, but it was the words of Moira Henderson, as reported in the magazine Possibility, that really struck home. Mrs Henderson referred to the fact that a cousin of the family had developed a life-changing, paralysing condition. And as his condition deteriorated, this man paid to go into a hospice so that his family could go on holiday without him. Mrs Henderson rightly said, that's not what holidays are all about. They're about relaxing in a comfortable and suitable environment with family or friends. Now, I think Mrs Henderson is absolutely right about that. And that's why I'm pleased that Visit Scotland has recognised this issue and is committed to tackling it head on. And why it is so appropriate that the Scottish Government is investing in the online programme to assist those working in the tourism industry to understand and even more importantly, to respond to the needs of all of those it may come into contact with. Now, colleagues will know I have a particular interest in heritage, and I know that adapting ancient buildings or making historic sites available to all can be a daunting task. And I was particularly interested to hear Graham Day's uh, issue, uh, raising of the particular problem about BSL interpretation being available in such facilities. But putting BSL aside, and I think Mr Day may be right, that there is a specific problem there. But otherwise, I have to say I've been very uh, pleased to read Historic Scotland's Access Guide, which offers very detailed information about the kind of buildings it owns, their accessibility, and also, and importantly, the accessibility of the exhibits on offer in any given place. And to give just one small quote of the kind of detail they go into, they say about one particular venue, which will remain nameless, the White House has reached over a large rough stone culvert cover and a slight threshold at the door. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be an easy place to get into. Perhaps it can't be. But at least people know before they get there exactly what the situation is, and perhaps it would influence their choice of places to visit. So I congratulate Historic Scotland for that, and perhaps they, like others, could do better when it comes to issues like BSL. But I do intend to contact Historic Scotland now to find out what feedback they've had from users and to see whether we can suggest any further improvements to them. As other colleagues have suggested, Inclusion Scotland has given us some very interesting information about the revamped Waverley Station. And I have to say that looking around um, when these changes were first made, it did occur to me that there was a, a problem there in the making. But clearly that problem is particularly acute for disabled users. And I do understand that discussions are now taking place to address the difficulties encountered. But isn't it just a shame that this effort was not put in to resolving potential issues before the changes were made? 
Why couldn't those changes have been discussed with some of the many um, organisations that assist people with a disability or who are there to help to look at access issues? That would have seemed to me to be common sense to a big organisation like Network Rail, and I now hope that those issues can be uh, resolved. Inclusion Scotland also made the point that accessible accommodation is often only available in more expensive hotels and that people with a disability are likely to be living, or more likely rather, to be living in poverty than those without. Now, clearly, this is a problem that requires more than just a structural response, but I would hope that it would be an issue that Visit Scotland and others would consider going forward. And I was very struck by the comments uh, Stuart Stevenson made before he left the debate um, about uh, the fact that insurance can be an issue for those with a disability or an illness. But actually, you don't need to be unwell to have an issue with insurance. You only have to be over a certain age. I've certainly experienced that when trying to book accommodation or hotels or holidays for my uh, parents, um, who at the time were both in their 80s. And it ended up in the situation where actually the insurance cost more than the holiday, which surely cannot be right in this day and age. Add to that the problem that my father has had a triple heart bypass and wanted to travel to America, forget the holiday, and even the fact that my stepmother had had a heart um, pacemaker implanted meant that she too found it almost impossible to travel to the United States. Now, that's not a problem for Visit Scotland, but it is the kind of issue that travellers are facing as our world becomes smaller and people want to travel around the world. Now, I'm delighted, as I say, with the efforts that Scottish uh, tourism is making and that Visit Scotland is leading in this. And I'm conscious of the fact that 10 years or so ago, they led literally the world on the issue of green tourism. And I sincerely hope that we will see them in the next few years leading on the issue of access accessibility to tourism. And I would just ask the Minister if he could indicate to us today whether accessibility and the issues related to it might become part of Visit Scotland's grading system in the near future. Thank you very much. I now call Chick Brodie to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I, too, uh, welcome the debate and, and our visitors today. Presiding Officer, my son is a professional golfer. A few years ago, he was asked to appear on the BBC uh, television programme, Today programme. And the purpose of the interview with him was that he wanted to introduce the UK special equipment manufactured in the USA, a para mobile sports equipment that would allow people with disabilities to have real and full access to the great game of golf. I use that to illustrate the possibility of one important element of tourism golf and the accessibility, increasing accessibility as part of general tourism. And I do so on the day that the greatest world golf attraction of greatest global tourism attraction, in my opinion, the Ryder Cup, starts with a practice round today and, of course, has the first round tomorrow. Now, when I questioned Greg, my, my son, about the viability of his project, he waxed lyrical about the uh, opportunities that uh, uh, the, this equipment afforded. And we discussed the needs and the ramifications around these. The equipment was chair-bound. For, for, for those that were chair-bound, but allowed them, and it wasn't just about golf, it was also about archery and other associated sports, allowed them to be erect, to drive into bunkers, to drive into uh, the trees and what have you, so that they could enjoy the full uh, attraction uh, of that sport. The major features he highlighted were not just also overcoming the physical barriers uh, in, in golf, but to optimising the, the opportunities that were even more buttressed by having good customer service, uh, people and staff and golf course owners' attitudes to the, de to the disabled and the availability of accessibility information, full information. And I encourage that all of these elements, I believe, will feature in the Ryder Cup as they should indeed elsewhere. In the Ryder Cup, we know some of the comments made by Visit Scotland that there will be absolutely no discrimination and all people will be treated equally to the same quality and level of service. That accessible information about the event uh, will be available again to all, including those with, with some infirmity. 
that services will be delivered appropriate to uh, actual as opposed to presumed need and the other provisions like access buddies and I'm just glad that George Adams isn't here <laughs> access buddies volunteers to help people with limited mobility uh, sensory impairment and the elderly allowing them to move around not just the course and the, and the, and the tented villages but in the surrounding area presiding officer accessible tourism contributes almost 370 million pounds to the Scottish economy that is no little amount and provides huge potential economic benefits to hundreds of businesses in Scotland, and not least on train services. It is significant that the opportunities that come with the business uh, are met with improved customer service. And we've already mentioned ScotRail that, uh, as it said in its briefing, it has highlighted its recent improvement to reduce the amount of notice uh, that uh, customers with disabilities uh, are recommended to give when booking travel assistance uh, with them. For example, a drop from 24 hours a notice requirement to just four hours. And the accessibility uh, for its staff through a passenger assistant assistance app can only add to the, the wider spectrum of improving customer service. All of similar events augment the possibilities of the Accessible Tourism Project, uh, which can make Scotland the most or one of the most accessible tourist or, uh, destinations in Europe by identifying physical and service barriers faced by those with dis disabilities holidaying or planning to holiday in Scotland. And the partnership under the auspices of that project of Capability Scotland, Visit Scotland and the government is to be recommended in that it programmes and overcomes the bar these barriers and is indeed a key vehicle to the future success of, of the accessibility programme. And, presiding officer, these barriers are not limited to the architecture of tourism, uh, to restaurants, accommodation, tourist attraction, but, uh, as I said earlier, to everything associated around that, around the, the periphery, whether it's shops, stations, etc., which complete, uh, and Patricia Ferguson made a very important point, it's not just about money, but completes the, 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 the tourism and the tourist experience. It's often been said, uh, and we've all said it, 2014 is the year we welcomed and continue to welcome the world. We've had the Commonwealth Games with services for people with disabilities provided by the front runner volunteers and Clydesiders. All of that has been and will be achieved and complemented by the online training programme which was mentioned earlier, a tool for staff in associate tourism enterprises, a vehicle to allow all of our guests who have a disability to fully enjoy the Scottish experience through excellent customer service. The presiding officer, these are all important, but real ongoing benefits will flow, most importantly, from the feedback of the customers, those with disabilities themselves. A professor Stephen Hawkins, a sufferer of MND, said in a quote, there is a severe lack of quality information about disabled access in the UK, particularly services giving, giving the end user's perspective. And as Jenny Mara uh, mentioned earlier, I, I too applaud uh, uh, Ewan MacDonald, a local, uh, lo uh, uh, a local uh, uh, person who, similar sufferer to Professor Hawkins, who's developed Ewan's Guide, which is a disabled access review and app, providing information, uh, credible information on tourist sites uh, compiled by him and other uh, members with disabilities. 600 places, 600 places have been reviewed by people with disabilities in 250 towns. That is no little achievement. Presiding officer, that kind of initiative, partnered by the work, as I said, of the Capability Scotland, Visit Scotland, and of course, uh, our government, can secure not just enjoyment, but can see Scotland at the forefront, indeed as a trailblazer for accessibility tourism uh, worldwide and for accessibility tourism growth in years to come. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Liam MacArthur to be followed by Jamie Hepburn. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy President Officer. Can I join with others in welcoming the presence uh, of uh, BSL signers for this debate? And as a member of the corporate body, I, I think I would reflect on the fact that 
Uh, this Parliament has a good track record in terms of uh, its accessibility. It's a key guiding principle uh, of the institution. But that's not to say that uh, we can't keep on learning and can't uh, keep on improving. Uh, I welcome to this debate and congratulate uh, the Minister on bringing forward uh, his motion and Jenny Mara on what I think is a helpful amendment, uh, drawing attention in particular to the accessible uh, transport project. Um, Colleagues may know, um, I should declare an interest as um, my brother is a wheelchair user after a serious uh, rugby accident uh, 18 years ago. Uh, and I would like to maybe draw on some of the first-hand experience uh, that he and we as a family have had uh, through the course of my remarks. But I would start by saying this is an issue of principle. It's a question of fairness, of equity, of social justice. Um, the Minister quite rightly said, why is it um, that those with a disability should have any less right uh, to a holiday or to a break uh, than the rest of us? And these debates very often, I think, um, have a danger of lapsing into discussions around uh, the costs, the costs of adaptations, the practicalities of adaptations, the costs of preparing materials, etc. Uh, so I think it's therefore important that we do emphasise the significant opportunities uh, that there are here. As others have mentioned, tourists with disabilities contribute around 370 million to our tourism industry. Uh, this trend is, is on the rise, reflecting perhaps the loyalty uh, of those who find destinations and accommodation, etc., that meets their needs. Uh, but high as that figure is, it could be and should be significantly higher. Research commissioned uh, from the University of Surrey, published earlier this year, suggested European tourism sector is missing out on around 140 billion euros per year due to a lack of support offered to travellers with special access needs. And this doesn't uh, surprised me. My first family holiday after my brother's accident uh, was to Barcelona 15 years ago and I was interested by Mark Griffin's comments about Spain being an exemplar. Um, certainly 15 years ago there was a lack of information available uh, at the time. There were facilities but not many and, and I think to the point that Patricia Ferguson made in Inclusion Scotland bring out very clearly in their briefing, it was at the higher end uh, of the market and perhaps not financially accessible to many who wished to uh, travel. Travel itself, not just the accessibility of the travel, but those with disabilities are often required to travel with um, particular clothing or medication or, or equipment. And particularly for those who are traveling, uh, taking a flight, as, as we were, it is not necessarily equipment that you can keep with you at all times. Uh, this was rammed home to us. The risks associated with it were brought home to us when British Airways then lost my brother's uh, shower chair on the flight on the way out. So I spent the first 48 hours of that holiday pushing my Spanish language skills to the absolute limit in pursuit of a replacement. Uh, and in order uh, for us not to be labouring under the misapprehension that this was us just being a bit unfortunate, uh, BEA uh, managed to uh, lose the two of the wheels on the return journey uh, a week later. There have been significant improvements since then, uh, but I think the Commission-sponsored research suggests we have a way to go yet. It's often a question, I think, of providing information for travellers, and I think the Scottish Government-sponsored pilot project during the Commonwealth Games uh, very much drilled down into this aspect. The hotel access statements, I, I entirely agree with the Minister, are not gobbledygook. They're absolutely uh, essential, as indeed is the training for volunteers. The feedback from that has, uh, I think, um, quite rightly been seen part uh, of the success uh, of those Games earlier uh, this summer. But frustrating as it is, uh, to find um, a lack of availability of facilities. It is nothing compared to the frustration felt by those who arrive uh, at a destination to find the facilities are not as advertised. Uh, and I think both Chick Brodie and, and uh, Jenny Mara have, have referred to Ewan's Guide uh, and the service that it provides. Uh, I think that's absolutely critical um, that what you have is uh, those with disabilities testing out uh, facilities, providing their feedback and making that feedback as widely available as possible. I think the more input, the more feedback there is, the better that uh, service will uh, become. Can I maybe conclude with a couple of examples from my own uh, constituency? Uh, Buckinghaven Cottage is a self-catering cottage in Kirtwell for people with dementia, given the increase in the numbers of dementia sufferers we've seen, the projections going forward. Um, I welcome the fact that this part of the market appears now um, to, be being, to be catered for. It's owned and managed by Marilyn Buck and herself, um, 25 years a nurse um, dealing with and supporting those with dementia as well as other uh, mental health 
issues, focusing on things like lighting, colour and signage, for example, brightly painted and labelled doors. Um, this facility, I think, is recognising the particular needs of dementia sufferers as well as those with autism uh, and other mental health uh, needs. And it highlights that as well as overall improved uh, provision and information, there is a need for specific, more tailored uh, provision as well. A final observation would be that the, the motion talks about the importance of public and private sectors working closely together, and I think that is uh, a point very well made. Um, it's illustrated to me by the visits that my brother, um, who's based in Edinburgh, continues to make up to, to Orkney, as well as the good self-catering accommodation and more accessible facilities are. The support received um, through the occupational therapist team, uh, from hoist to the provision of expert advice, has been absolutely invaluable. Without the contribution uh, from the public sector, what is in offer uh, from private providers and local businesses would be far less accessible, and I think that is probably reflected uh, nationwide. So, Deputy President Officer, I welcome uh, this debate. The raising of public awareness and improving information available are absolutely critical to removing many of the physical, mental and other barriers uh, that continue to exist. This is a simple question of fairness and equity. But by reinforcing the message about economic benefits, I think we also improve the chances of these improvements happening more quickly. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Jamie Hepburn to be followed by Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President Robertson. Can I thank uh, the Scottish Government for bringing forward uh, today's debate? And uh, one of the reasons I was motivated to speak was uh, I was contacted by a constituent with his own experience of the uh, difficulties he's experienced in uh, trying to go on holiday with his wife who requires the use of uh, a wheelchair and I'll maybe try and return uh, to that uh, uh, later. Uh, President Officer, uh, tourism is of, of clear and obvious importance to Scotland's uh, economy. Recent figures show that there was uh, some 11.2 million tourism trips, uh, tourist trips to Scotland uh, contributing spend expenditure of some £2.6 billion. So it's clearly an important sector but we should always be looking uh, to grow that uh, sector. And some uh, might look at the uh, provision uh, uh, of uh, infrastructure for accessible uh, tourism uh, as uh, a challenge, but uh, they should not be looking at it uh, that way, because in fact for Scotland it is a massive uh, opportunity. We know that uh, the uh, accessible tourism already contributes uh, almost £400 million to the Scottish economy. Uh, some people refer to that already, but we know that worldwide the number of people uh, with impairments accounts for uh, somewhere between 600 and 900 million uh, people uh, out of uh, uh, 124 million people in Europe who have a disability. 70 per cent are uh, physically and financially able to travel uh, and often uh, with uh, accompanying uh, friends and uh, family. And indeed, the uh, estimated purchasing power of people with disabilities in the UK is some £80 billion uh, a year. And uh, people with disabilities, and I'm trying to take on board the comments of my colleague uh, Dennis Robertson in that regard, I'll try and use uh, that term, I'll try not to uh, let him down. But people uh, with disabilities uh, represent a huge uh, market uh, potential. This is a chance to ensure that Scotland is prepared to benefit by accessible uh, tourism. But there is some way uh, to go, because we know that 70% uh, of disabled people are able to travel, but because of a lack of accessible tourism and accommodation and basic facilities, uh, they do not. And I'm pleased to see uh, that work is being done, though. Um, the uh, Minister and others have uh, mentioned uh, the uh, uh, training programme to help uh, make tourist, ser tourist services more uh, accessible. I very much uh, welcome that uh, initiative. And we know uh, that uh, in this year, with the Commonwealth Games and the Red Cup, we know there have been great efforts to make sure that they have been uh, accessible uh, events. I would uh, say, and I'm not saying there hasn't been massive work involved in ensuring that those uh, uh, flagship events were as accessible as possible, but it's probably rather easier uh, to put in arrangements in place for one-off events that it might be to ensure uh, our tourist facilities are accessible on a, a, a more uh, general uh, basis. And indeed, Inclusion Scotland uh, provided a helpful briefing that set out a, a range of uh, issues, uh, for example, they uh, highlighted the, uh, one of the key barriers to tourism for disabled uh, uh, people uh, remaining uh, the shortage of fully accessible uh, public uh, transport. Um, and uh, that reflects uh, some of the concerns uh, raised by my constituent. I want to, uh, in the time I have left, uh, deal with them uh, directly because uh, he contacted me to uh, set out that he's had problems uh, in the past two years trying to arrange suitable 
disabled holiday accommodation in Scotland uh, for his wife, uh, who is uh, disabled and wheelchair-bound due to uh, frontotemporal dementia, and she needs fully accessible disabled accommodation with overhead or portable uh, hoist standard in a bedroom uh, and toilet. And he spoke of a lack of uh, hotels and B or uh, B and Bs in Scotland have such uh, facilities, and indeed. Uh, uh, those that uh, often provide them, and I think this has been referred to, uh, will often charge extra for such uh, equipment. He could only find one establishment, uh, which in uh, Mr uh, Robertson's uh, constituent has been mentioned by Nanette Milne, a uh, uh, crafty uh, opportunity uh, holidays, which did not charge extra uh, for specialist uh, disabled uh, equipment. And again, this was a concern that Inclusion Scotland uh, referred to in their briefing, presiding officer, uh, that uh, uh, Accessible accommodation is often only available in the more expensive hotels, or they have to, uh, or they will charge for specialist equipment. And of course, we know uh, that uh, many people with disabilities are uh, more than likely than non-disabled people to uh, be living in uh, poverty. But yet, they have to bear uh, the brunt of those extra uh, costs. And I've written to Visit Scotland on behalf of my constituent, and uh, they have uh, replied to me, uh, uh, and they've talked of the accessible tourism uh, project. Uh, to tr which is obviously part of that work is to try and uh, uh, ensure the sharing of information that businesses helping each other uh, to find the most suitable and reasonably priced equipment. I hope uh, that that can be successful and uh, can lead to more locations not charging a premium for the provision of such uh, uh, equipment. Another issue uh, that my constituent uh, raised and that was touched upon by I think both Jenny Mara and Annette Milne is the uh, lack of uh, disabled access uh, toilets. Uh, across uh, Scotland. This can make uh, journeys in Ion impossible and uh, very difficult indeed. And, uh, indeed, uh, the, uh, uh, my constituent will refer to particular uh, problems in the Highlands, the Borders and uh, uh, the Western and Northern Isles. Uh, he actually described there's no-go areas for uh, disabled people who need, uh, or people with disabilities, I should say, who need uh, a fully accessible uh, uh, toilet. So, and that was another thing I raised with uh, Visit Scotland. And of course, they say they don't have jurisdiction for this uh, particular uh, area, and I, I, of course, accept that, but I hope they can work with their partners to uh, uh, try and improve the situation. Can, do I have time to give way, uh, President Officer? Yes. Indeed, I will, then. Uh, Mackenzie. It's a very brief point. Do you feel that local authorities have got a role in that uh, provision of public toilets, and they need to be um, partners in this? Can we have one well, one well absolutely. I think um, uh, they clearly have probably the lead role in the provision of uh, such uh, facilities, uh, uh, but I do think uh, it would be uh, helpful Visit Scotland can uh, work with them as partners and try and improve uh, uh, the, situ uh, the situation. What, the one last uh, issue that my uh, constituent raised, um, which uh, might not have been thought to be immediately uh, obvious uh, uh, as a tourism issue, is uh, difficulties in accessing personal uh, care or respite hours uh, for his wife whilst on holiday, um, because he has uh, had problems whereby um, travelling to uh, an area, uh, the uh, a local authority that he's travelling to may uh, uh, provide a respite, care and assistance, but other areas won't, so it seems to be uh, rather patchy. Again, that's not a prime responsibility of Visit Scotland, but it's clearly an important part of ensuring we have the best uh, set-up possible to cater uh, for people uh, with disabilities. So I offer these uh, concerns on behalf of uh, my constituent and others uh, like him, uh, hopefully on a constructive uh, uh, basis. Uh, I do thank the Scottish Government and Visit Scotland for the work uh, they're engaged in, and I look forward to hearing uh, the work that will uh, continue to make sure uh, that Scotland has uh, 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 got the best uh, form of uh, accessible tourism infrastructure uh, that we can possibly have. Thank you very much. And I now call on Dennis Robertson to be followed by Margaret McCullough. Uh, I thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, Presenting officer, I made the point earlier um, with my intervention with the minister when I was um, saying people with disabilities, um, because I think it's important that we recognise it as people first. That people have a disability or an impairment. And it is very easy, and I, I, I've done it myself many a times, and perhaps we'll, can, we'll probably do it, uh, uh, I've no doubt, um, maybe even this afternoon or some other time, mentioned the word disabled prior to the people. But I think it's important when we're looking at this whole issue about accessible tourism, that we're looking at that broad aspect of accessibility and what it actually means. And I think, you know, uh, I think most members this afternoon 
have made a very telling contributions about the wider aspect of, of what it does mean, not to the individual themselves, but to that individual and their families. And quite often when we're looking at holidays, we're looking at perhaps a family holiday. And uh, my, my daughter, presiding officer, um, during her uh, uh, training as a paediatric nurse, was doing some social care work and, and I take up Nanette Milne's point about uh, perhaps uh, the nursing college is looking at uh, nurses getting into some aspect of social care and doing some sort of respite etc within maybe some holiday destinations but my daughter actually uh, does care for a, a young man uh, with very severe and complex mobility issues and you know, she says that the, the difficulty she has, you know, when she's out with him and, and she's been on holiday with him is just this basic accessibility to what we consider just the normal sort of places that we would like to visit. And, and that includes things like shops or, or restaurants or, or cafes or, you know, just, just things that we take for granted. But I think we have come a long way because I've actually been involved within this sort of whole accessible aspect of uh, uh, within access, uh, access panels for probably about 40 years, uh, presiding officer. And, uh, and can I say that it's always been worthwhile because I've seen the progress of, of what has actually happened. I myself, when I'm looking at going on holiday, um, I tend to look at venues that doesn't require me to cross busy roads because it's at a time that I usually believe if I'm going abroad on holiday that I tend to leave my guide dog uh, at home because I think he probably deserves a holiday from me at the, same time, <laughs> at the same time as I probably deserve a holiday with my family. And, and I, I do that quite deliberately because you know, I, I want to be able to still have this sort of degree of independence where I want to be able to enjoy the freedom of being on holiday in that relaxation. I have many friends um, who have disabilities, presenting officer, and quite often our examples that we bring to this chamber are through either family members or friends. And one friend in particular tells me that his biggest frustration and we've witnessed it ourselves, is when he wants to just visit other friends in other parts of this country, or when he goes down south, or, or, or indeed a, he visits abroad, it's just going out for a meal. And he says, and when he does find uh, maybe restaurants um, that have a level accessibility, he then finds he can't get to use the facilities, although there are accessible toilets within the restaurant. The problem is that the tables and chairs from where he is to get to the accessible toilets are such that there's no room. And, you know, we, we then have to ask people, to, would you mind moving, etc., so we can get a wheelchair through. That shouldn't be the case. We should always have direct access to accessible toilets. The other frustrating thing, presiding officer, that many people bring up, and I dare say, you know, I'm sure many tourists, when they come to this country sometimes, just shake their head and go, my goodness, you know, we've got an accessible toilet here. Yeah, it's uh, actually got the, uh, it's got the trolley for the, the cleaner. It's got the, the pail, the mops. It's got all the other bits of uh, maybe waste bins or whatever. And sometimes, yeah, we've got an accessible toilet, but people can't get in to use them. We need to be sure that when we have these facilities, they are there and they're there for the purpose they were designed for, presiding officer. And access means accessibility. You know, it should be there. When we're looking at um, uh, people with maybe sensory impairments, and many of our wonderful facilities, presiding officer, whether it be our, our castles or whether it be our Holyrood Palace across the road, which, which is actually an exemplar for people who are, are deaf or hard of hearing or with other sensory impairments. Um, we've got to look at that the equipment actually works, but that the people actually providing it know, know about the equipment themselves. Many places that actually do provide hearing loops, for instance, the hearing loops could either be faulty or the person that is there has no idea on how to manage or instruct about the usage of that particular hearing loop. But I want to stick to some basics, presenting on, because it is about awareness and common sense quite often. And quite often it is just that, you know, I, and the frustration for a person with a hearing loss, for instance, if they go in to buy a ticket, a ticket office to go into a particular venue, they're saying that sometimes the lighting isn't good enough. 
so they can't lip read the person behind the glass counter. But worse than that presenting officer, quite often the person's looking down or looking away. So therefore, there's no absolute way they could actually lip read the person. Anyway, so it's that basic aspect of training and awareness that we need to be aware of. Aware of. And that doesn't cost money. That just costs a little bit of training and awareness. Not in itself a huge uh, expense for people to take on board. And I take on board what the Minister said about Visit Scotland website and the training facility and the training tools that's there. But can I gently say to the Minister and to those who create the websites for Visit Scotland, it could be better. Because when I navigate that particular website to look at accessible accommodation through the search engines, it's, it's not particularly easy. And I would have thought that when we're actually trying to embrace people to Scotland, regardless where they come from and regardless what their needs are, that we should have perhaps in the statement from Visit Scotland something to say that, yes, our doors are open. And if you have a particular disability, impairment, need, whatever, we can manage it. We can cope with that. It's not difficult. Let's be up We're front. We're to a close, please. Let's be up front about what we mean about accessibility, presiding officer. It should be what it actually states it is. It's accessible. Thank you. Thanks very much. I now call on Margaret McCulloch to be followed by Rob Gibson. Thank you, presiding officer. Time and again in debates in Parliament, we have discussed how we could and why we must make Scotland the best destination in the world. From those debates, it's clear that Scotland has what it takes to be a world-class destination. In many ways, and in many places, it already is. We know that tourism makes a huge contribution to the Scottish economy, and Barclays expects spending from overseas visitors to grow by 40% by 2017. We have discussed Visit Scotland's thematic approach to marketing Scotland, from the year of Creative Scotland to the year of Natural Scotland, to the year of homecoming. We have heard about the events which bring people here and keep them coming back, the Ryder Cup, the Commonwealth Games and our world-renowned festival season. We have debated business tourism and how Scotland has to be more joined up with better transport links and more of our young people learning modern languages so that everyone is made welcome to our country. Today, we are asked to take another look at tourism. We have been asked to think about how we make Scotland more than just an attractive destination, but also a more accessible one. Indeed, the Labour Amendment specifically applauds the work of the Accessible Tourism Project in aspiring to make Scotland the most accessible tourist destination in Europe. The European Commission study by the University of Surrey found that the tourism sector across Europe is losing up to €142 billion Euros every year because too many attractions, venues and trans transport connections are not accessible enough for those with special access needs. If they were accessible, then tourism in Europe could support an extra 3.4 million jobs. Thankfully, Scotland and the UK do well in comparison to other destinations in Europe. Compared to other European countries, we have a relatively good infrastructure for tourism. We have a wealth of visitor attractions. We have brown signage. We have tourist information offices. We have extensive public transport, although it could be better. We have a broadband network that has been improved and expanded as technology moves on. And we have widespread access to ATM machines and cashless payments. And we have made more progress in meeting the special access requirements of people with disabilities than many of our European neighbours. We still have some way to go, but I think we're moving in the right direction. For government, accessibility must remain a priority. For business, making their hotel or their venue or their attraction more accessible must be viewed as an investment more than a cost. However, accessible tourism is not just about physical infrastructure. It is equally about having reliable information and a good standard of service. The Accessible Tourism Project consulted widely with disabled people and, in addition to costs, the themes emerging from that consultation were the need for travellers to have more information, better communication and customer service. Our venues, our attractions and our hoteliers must provide information on accessible accessibility as standard. That information must also be kept up to date. 
With that information, people with disabilities are in a much better position to plan their journeys. And we also need to ensure a good standard of customer service throughout the hospitality and tourism sector. The project identified concern about the attitudes of staff towards disabled people, as well as the service they can sometimes receive. I would therefore welcome the development of the new training tool by Visit Scotland and others to promote accessibility to tourism. We have to address and we have to prevent behaviour which makes disabled people feel uncomfortable patronised or in any way unwelcome. If Scotland is to be a world-class destination, then visitors should expect world-class service. Presiding officer, we cannot underestimate the potential of Scottish tourism. Tourism in Scotland is growing, and it was growing even when the economy as a whole was contracting. Scotland is one of the world's greatest destinations, and all the time it's getting better. So let's make sure that everyone has the chance to enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Rob Gibson to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Well, thank you, President Officer. Uh, the concept of people first and their ability to get to parts of our country uh, for holidays uh, is a very complex and difficult one to achieve. Uh, but with a disposable income, from the grey pound, which has been recognised, and increasingly for the disabled pound, uh, that can bolster many local services and businesses if the welcome included uh, for them uh, is making it easy for the less able to arrive. So people with disability getting to parts of the country, which I represent, is perhaps one of the challenges which a number of members have already mentioned in the debate. And I'd like to take that forward a bit in two ways. First of all, I want to refer to a book uh, which was written in 2002 called The Creaky Traveller in the Northwest Highlands of Scotland, a journey for the mobile but not agile, because this recognises the range of abilities that there are that we are talking about today. And this cu American couple, Warren and Gerda Rovech, uh, did uh, talk about the kinds of facilities that they required at the less disabled uh, end of the spectrum. But nevertheless, what they showed was, and it's a really good Americanism, I suppose, that many people are needful. They're needful in various levels of uh, requirement. And I think that their book identified the kinds of things that would make it possible for them to enjoy a holiday in bed and breakfasts and things like that, uh, and the kind of facilities that they would require. And I'll come back to uh, their issues in a minute. But in order for people to get to places such as the Northwest, it means that they're going to have to travel by their own transport uh, or by public transport. And as we've been mentioning earlier, that's where some of the major problems lie. Of course, there's low entry buses in the cities. And indeed, there are in the city of Inverness. But getting access to those in the northwest of Sutherland, where there are very few transport links, is a huge problem. So I think that bus route development funds should have ability issues built into the way in which the money is given, not just for the cities, but to make sure that the buses, which uh, Stagecoach, for example, have uh, uh, told us that the use are available for routes out with the large centres so that people can have access to them. But someone with a, a, a wheelchair trying to get onto a coach, which is the more likely form of transport, is something which uh, makes it very difficult indeed, although uh, the stagecoach coaches have a lift mechanism. But given their timetables, that's quite a time-consuming activity for anyone accessing a bus. Then when we look at the rail uh, situation, we're talking about many non-staffed railway stations in the north and west. We're talking about lack of aid except for the staff who are on the train to help someone with uh, a, an immobility problem. So we've got to, we've got to ask ourselves, is it possible for these people to travel to places, the nearest railhead uh, to uh, Assen, for example, which I'll mention in a minute, is some... Uh, 30 miles away, 40 miles away. Uh, we're talking about them wanting to use a train 
is there someone there to help? And the issue about that has to be dealt with in the staffing policies of ScotRail. The third aspect is on Calmac ferries in particular, and indeed the ferries for the Northern and Southern Isles in Orkney, and indeed for Shetland. Now, I'm sorry that Liam MacArthur is not here at this moment, but I'm sure he would agree with me. But the fact is that the older ferries have very poor facilities indeed for people with, immobili with mobility problems. So the work that requires to be done on these ferries is something which is a major catch-up in order to make them disability uh, friendly in terms of the DDI issues. But the new ferries, I hope, are, and when we finally see the ferry to um, Stornoway, which is coming up, the Loch Seaforth, a couple of months late, I hope that not only the electrics work in it, but also that the lift systems are properly accessible as well. But turning to the facilities which we were talking about there, I want to mention particularly uh, a place which I visited when it was opened in 2006, the All Abilities Path at Leedcher Essach in Little Assent, that's in the far northwest of Sutherland. The pathway was completed in 2005, officially opened in May uh, 2006 by Jamie Andrew, the mountaineer who was badly frostbitten and lost his limbs. And he opened the path uh, as after the hard work of the Kulag Community Woodland Trust. So leaving the new uh, all-access uh, car park at Little Essex near Loch Assent Lodge, the pathway, which is suitable for wheelchairs as well as those limited mobility, leads to two lochs along a well-made and carefully graded trackway. At each of the two lochs, there's a picnic area with composting toilets accessible for wheelchairs, a shelter and a, a jetty to give access to boats for fishing. That is disabled angling access, and there are two different boats where people can be aided onto those in order to be able to uh, partake of the angling sport. So that's an example in the far northwest of Sutherland where a whole project has been developed that allows people with a range of abilities to access these things. And I hope that it would suggest that we need to make sure that the transport and accommodation uh, available through Ewan's guide identifies the places where it's possible to visit there easily. But just to finish up and taking a point which Patricia Ferguson made, the intangible and tangible cultural elements that people can benefit from spiritually on these holidays for both people with uh, disabilities and their carers is something which is the great possibility that comes out of visits to places like Little Ascent and indeed which the creaky travellers that I mentioned at the beginning benefited from when they talked about Celtic history traditions coming alive as our hosts, the hosts of the book uh, meander their way along. What an opportunity there is to see something that is so uplifting and that everybody of all abilities should be able to access as this debate has shown we're on the way, but not there yet. Thank you very much for that very detailed speech. I now call on Stuart Stevenson. Uh, seven minutes or thereby, a generous seven minutes. Uh, thank you very much <laughs> indeed, presiding officer. Um, let me just kind of disagree with everybody who's spoken so far. We have been utterly without ambition in our contributions to this debate, and I intend to remedy that in my seven minutes or so. And we've just heard from Rob Gibson, and he said, we're not there yet. Nobody's described what there is. Nobody has said, what would the world look like if we had a blank canvas and we drew it anew? And the reality is that the world we would all seek is a world where there are no special facilities for anybody with special needs or disabilities. Not because we don't provide for them, but because every facility meets their needs and everybody uses them. Now, is that a hopelessly ambitious position to take? Not necessarily. If you travel on a Class 170 train on our railways, and that's mostly what travels between Edinburgh and Glasgow, so many of us may have done that, uh, and elsewhere, the toilets are disabled capable. They're not disabled toilets. We all use them. And why shouldn't that be the case everywhere? 
We are looking... I will in a minute or two, if I may, Mr. Robertson. I just want to say a little bit more first. I think we've spent far too much time focusing on people's inabilities and not about realising people's capabilities that we currently don't provide for. I mean, let me just give you a few examples. Um, I had a colleague I used to work with, registered blind. His visual acuity was essentially restricted to being able to distinguish light from dark. And yet, one of his hobbies was flying gliders. No, he didn't do it on his own, but he was able to fly gliders. Now, wasn't that stepping up to something ambitious? Do you know that you can get a private pilot's license when you've only got one eye and you can't hear? Why shouldn't more people who've only one eye and no hearing do private pilot's licenses? Why don't we have cookery courses that people with a range of uh, shortcomings in sight or in hearing or in touch are access to gardening courses? Why shouldn't holidays for people uh, with uh, some restricted capabilities also be holidays for their carers? In other words, there's another team of carers take away, which doubles the economic benefit and doubles the benefit uh, to individuals. When we get away from the ghettoization of some members of our community, and we're all the same, and we're all accessing the same facilities, then that's the real triumph. Mr. Robertson. Dennis Robertson, if you wish. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, Mr Stevenson, the, the gold standard which was spoken about earlier by Nanette Milne and Jimmy Hepburn about crafty opportunity uh, holidays, the challenges there are, yes, um, uh, ex, uh, there so people with uh, mobility or sensory impairments can use, but they're fully accessible to people who have no mobility or no sensory impairments whatsoever. And I think the, 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 the beauty of somewhere like that is to say that this can happen. This is the gold standard. It is fully accessible to all, regardless of their need. Thank you, Stuart Stevenson. Delightful, excellent, and a model for everywhere. But we only succeed when everywhere is like that. And I think we're not setting our ambition high enough. Now, of course, we can't either, in reality, realise every aspect of that ambition, probably ever. But on the other hand, if we aim for the highest possible standard and drop a little bit short, isn't that better than aiming for mediocrity and succeeding? And I think that's the key message, I would say, uh, to colleagues around here. There are also a few other things we haven't had mentioned. There are a whole range of sensory deprivations that people might have and ways in which we might uh, stimulate senses. And in particular, that might be the case uh, for people with a degree of mental ill health, who would benefit from perhaps uh, being able to go into a garden and just listen to the bumblebees gathering the pollen from the flowers. And I love doing that as someone without perhaps any particular needs. You know, creating gardens. There was a, there was a, a garden for smells in Aberdeen at one stage, I don't know if it's still there, which people with particular needs uh, felt uh, were interesting. Um, in my intervention with the minister, I talked about the need to consider people who are suffering ill health temporary or permanent as it might be, who are unable to get insurance to travel internationally, who are, are experiencing some limitations. And I think we've got to include them. Now, what does that mean? That means they need to have confidence that, for example, if they need to, they can get their specialist medicines, perhaps in a Harako or some more distant part of Scotland. We need to make sure that happens and that the local medical people can get access to their records if they require to give confidence to these people that that's going to be possible. Let's not underrate the ambition of people who've got uh, apparent restrictions. One of the great events, I, don't, I, I haven't heard of it for a wee while, uh, the Grampian Society for the Blind used to have um, a racetrack day when blind people drove around a racetrack. Now, there was somebody sitting beside them saying, left, right, slow down, occasionally, slow down! Great excitement for people who are blind. And, of course, us sighted people got blindfolded and uh, drove around the track blind as well. And we weren't nearly as fast as the people who had no sight at all. Um, I think, too, think of Evelyn Glennie who plays uh, in an orchestra and yet has no hearing. Why shouldn't we encourage people who have no hearing to follow Evelyn Glennie 
and have a holiday playing in an orchestra, learning an instrument. We've got to use every opportunity to create for people the opportunity to extend their experience, extend their capabilities, to test the limits of their capabilities. And that applies to all of us, by the way. This is not a ghetto issue, it's for all of us. That's what life is about. It's about grabbing it by the throat, trying new things, and we've got to create a society and a world uh, where that is possible. We will triumph when there are no disabled signs visible everywhere. We will triumph when everybody is treated equally and has equal opportunity. It may not be possible, but it's about time we started to think in terms of trying. Presiding officer. Thank you very much. And I now call on Margaret McDougall, a generous seven minutes. Thank you, presiding officer. And I too welcome BSL to the chamber today. When I first thought about writing this speech, I thought about my wheelchair bound brother who has traveled extensively since being confined to a wheelchair. For example, he's been to Canada, America, and New Zealand. And yet, when he wanted to do a coach tour of the Scottish Highlands, he was told by the tour company he couldn't because private coaches do not have to provide access for people with disabilities until, I believe, 2020 in Scotland. But he was offered a coach tour in England because they do provide for the disabled. I sincerely hope my brother is still fit and able enough to go a coach tour of the Highlands in six years' time. So I ask the Minister today if this government has any plans to bring this legislation forward. Because it is vital that we ensure, where possible, that all our tourism attractions and destinations within Scotland are easily accessible with the required facilities and that all hospitality and tourism industry staff have adequate training on accessibility. The Visit Scotland Accessible Tourism Involvement Events Report, which was published in December 2011 by Capability Scotland, highlighted numerous barriers to disabled people. Physical access, a lack of information, and the most highlighted problem was that of staff attitude and customer service. In terms of physical access, I wish to speak about a specific part, and that is of access to toilet facilities. The Capability Scotland report states that it's no good the restaurant bar or tourist attraction being accessible to a wheelchair user if they don't provide an accessible toilet. For example, the website Changing Places lists 99 fully accessible public toilets, which have space for two carers to support the person, a changing bench and a tracking hoist. Although this is up from 57 when the report was produced, Scotland still pales in comparison to the rest of the UK who have 565 of these. It would be beneficial if better guidance could be realised on the expectation of an accessible toilet and I wonder if Visit Scotland would consider installing these in larger visitor centres. It would also be helpful if better guidance on what constitutes an accessible toilet was made available. My second point on the availability of information shows there is still a huge gap in information across Scotland. For example, before my speech today, I had a look over the CalMAC website in terms of accessibility information for both Arran and Cumbria's ferries. The information was difficult to find, and when I did find it, there was little of it. Perhaps, as uh, Rob Gibson mentioned earlier, because there isn't much uh, available for disabled people. All I could really find out was that disabled toilets were available on some of their larger ships. It just isn't acceptable that if a disabled person manages to find suitable accommodation, like a hotel or self-catering cottages, which we've heard about today, they then find they are trapped there because there is no accessible facilities in the surrounding area or that there is no suitable transport to get them there in the first place. Disabled people shouldn't have to go hunting for this information. It should be clear, concise and easily accessible 
so everyone knows exactly what kind of facilities, conditions and access they can expect before they travel. More so given this information is crucial to making an informed choice and particularly when our islands and our economy are so reliant on tourism. This is, of course, doesn't just apply to CalMAC, no matter the organisation, public or private, the onus should be on them to make sure this information can be easily found. It should also provide, be, be provided in a range of formats and staff should have proper training so they can deal with questions on access and which alternative information formats are available. It would also be helpful if people with disabilities were involved in access audits of accommodation and tourist attractions. This would help facilitate the provision of better information. On the issue of staff attitude and customer service, it seems that issues arise when staff lack understanding of certain conditions and the best way to provide support for them is through training. So training is essential if we are to improve on this factor. In advance of the Commonwealth Games, it was great to see Visit Scotland launching a website to provide Scotland's hospitality industry with the knowledge to cater for the requirements of people with access needs, including those with physical, sensory or learning disabilities, elderly visitors and parents with small children. This was an excellent example. Accessibility information was easy to find for all venues and all organisations were linked up on the basis of providing the best support possible to those with access needs. I welcome the fact that the e-learning accessible tourism course will also be used for the Ryder Cup. I wonder if the Minister can confirm today whether the site will be rolled out across Scotland so that the whole industry can have the knowledge and confidence to cater for the requirements of people with access oh, excuse me, accessibility needs. In conclusion, we have made great strides in accessible tourism through the Commonwealth Games and we must keep this momentum going. I would love to see the e-learning accessible tourism course more widely used, as well as all organisations in Scotland working together to provide up-to-date and easy-to-access information. And if we do that, more people with disabilities will be able to enjoy a holiday in Scotland. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Mark McDougall, uh, seven minutes or thereby. I, I have been recruited, presiding sorry. officer. Uh, I'm, I'm me. sure Margaret McDougall would welcome me to the clan nonetheless. Um, Sir, can I begin by directing members to my declaration of interests? I'm the trustee uh, of a, a recently established charity called Friendly Access, which uh, is uh, there to uh, encourage and facilitate businesses and public bodies to uh, increase their awareness, understanding and openness to uh, individuals on the autistic spectrum. Uh, and I'll be touching on some of the these themes uh, during my speech. Um, Stuart Stevenson spoke of the, uh, the Garden of Smells uh, in Aberdeen that, that he recalled. Um, I'm not sure if the, the one he refers to still exists, but uh, the recent uh, refurbishment and uh, reinvigoration of the Duthie Park in Aberdeen, uh, which was brought about by heritage lottery funding and also uh, a significant bequeathment. Um, while I was vice convener of housing and environment uh, at Aberdeen City Council, I instigated uh, the incorporation of a sensory area to the Duthie Park to ensure that those uh, individuals who would benefit from uh, such an area could do so. Um, there's been much talk uh, in the debate, presiding officer, of, of, of physical disability or rather visible uh, disability. Uh, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, those individuals whose disability may not be obvious uh, when they present uh, at facilities uh, or when they uh, travel on holiday. And I think there is good work being done. I certainly welcome the uh, funding that uh, has been uh, allocated by the Scottish Government. I certainly welcome the launch of the online training programme as well, which I hope uh, businesses across Scotland will sign up to. 
I think one of the things that's been highlighted throughout the debate is that often when we think of tourism, we think of a visitor attraction or we think of a hotel, but actually uh, our entire society uh, should be accessible because people who come here uh, to visit Scotland or people from within Scotland who want to holiday within Scotland will use all kinds of different uh, facilities and services in order to uh, enjoy themselves. And we shouldn't limit ourselves to thinking that we're simply talking about uh, visitor attractions uh, and accommodation necessarily, although that said, I'll probably find that I spend the rest of my speech talking about those very things. Um, but I want to focus as well on some of the, the challenges and, um, uh, and ambitions that there are out there for how we could take things further and things that could be done a little bit differently. Uh, a few, couple of months ago, I did a, a large piece of work around uh, autism in the airports in Scotland for uh, individuals who wanted to, to, to fly um, and to try and help people on the autistic spectrum uh, find their way through the airport process. And there is a lot of good work going on in Scotland's airports, and it was about bringing that to the fore and making people aware of it. But it got me to thinking about what happens in other countries, because if we want to attract people to come to Scotland, then for those people on the autistic spectrum who may need to fly in order to come to Scotland, that same process and those same supports would need to be replicated in their home nations as well. And I realise that the Minister does not have jurisdiction over what happens in these areas, but it is perhaps something that may be worth considering in terms of uh, discussions and conversations with uh, representatives of other governments around what they are doing to ensure that their uh, uh, nationals who want to come to Scotland are able to do so uh, from the point at which they leave their country. Uh, another issue is uh, around accommodation. And we talk a lot, we're talking a lot in this debate about accessibility, but it's also about security as well. Uh, if I could even use my own example, my son is what we would call uh, an escape artist. Um, and uh, when we go on holiday, if we want to book a hotel room, um, we have to be very careful because many hotel rooms, all you have to do to exit them is to turn the handle and open the door. Now, for a lot of people who have... Uh, uh, individuals on the autistic spectrum, that is a genuine concern because uh, often they have no concept of danger, uh, they have no concept of the rights and wrongs of leaving the hotel room and often uh, the uh, autism, uh, my, my son's autism comes with a, a free sleep disorder thrown in and that often is the case as well for many people on the autistic spectrum. They are up at four or five in the morning, often before anybody else in the household is. If he was to wake up at four or five in the morning, turn the handle on the hotel room door and exit, we we would wake up a couple of hours later and he could well have left the facility. So we have to also think about from a business perspective for, for hotels and accommodation out there, how they are geared up in terms of the, the accommodation that they provide to cater best for individuals uh, and, and their particular needs. Also on facilities, um, one of the things which has been highlighted to me by parents, I put a, a post up on a couple of groups that I, uh, I'm on on Facebook asking for people to give me their thoughts and their experiences. Uh, one mum said that um, when they arrived at uh, a, a local attraction uh, in Scotland, they, they found that it was very easy to get in, uh, very easy to get the discount for uh, disabled individuals and carers. But the issue for them was the queuing for everything within that attraction once they got in. And for many people on the autistic spectrum, the concept of waiting in a queue can cause great anxiety, great stress, often meltdown. Um, the, we perhaps need to think about facilities looking uh, at having fast track procedures like some uh, major uh, attractions have introduced in order to facilitate uh, those families who, who will have those difficulties being able to access opportunities. In terms of the uh, changing places toilets, one of the things that has been brought to my attention is that there is no changing places toilet at the recently refurbished Museum of Scotland. And that is something that parents have highlighted to me as something they would like to see perhaps being addressed. And I wonder if the Minister might speak to uh, his, his colleague, the Cabinet Secretary for Culture, and, and perhaps raise that as a concern and see whether there is something that could be done there. Because obviously that is a, a facility that many families uh, and many individuals are going to visit who would require uh, a changing places facility. And if we can put one in place there, we should definitely do so. Other um, issues that, that, that arise as well um, are... Uh, 
even something as simple as within toilets, uh, hand dryer facilities, which uh, are um, often very terrifying to people with particular sensory disorders, but they can often be the only game in town, other, either that or you're drying your hands with toilet paper, which is not a very dignified thing to have to do. I do have a couple of other things to mention, President Officer, or if that's okay for me to maybe take just a little bit longer to mention them. I, I, I see you're saying no. Um, so I'll, I'll wrap up simply by saying there's a couple of asks that I would have that the Scottish Government could maybe look at. One is uh, looking at retro fitting of existing public buildings to try and make sure that they are accessible for people who are visiting them. Uh, and the other is looking at how building standards define accessible toilets, because the feedback that I'm receiving uh, is that current uh, accessible toilet definitions and building standards are not cutting the mustard. And that's maybe something the Minister can take back to his colleagues who have particular responsibilities in these areas and see what can be done. Excellent. Many thanks. And I now call on Murdo Fraser. Seven minutes, please, hold there, uh, Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, uh, can I start by uh, thanking the, uh, the Scottish Government for bringing forward uh, this debate and for Fergus Ewing for his uh, introductory remarks, and indeed to everybody who's contributed to what has been a very uh, wide-ranging and informative debate. Uh, and there has been, I think, a, a refreshing change in terms of the tone of the debate, uh, not to be talking about independence for, for once in quite a number of weeks. Hopefully, we can get on to uh, other business in, in coming weeks as well. The, the background to all this is, is that in recent times, society has challenged the hurdles that prevent people with disabilities enjoying a full and normal life. After the last few months uh, of uh, intense campaigning, I'm sure we're all looking forward to the uh, October recess. I think that's uh, precisely 15 days to go uh, until that starts. Um, however, as, uh, as Fergus Ewing said, many of those with life-altering conditions don't get the opportunity to have a break. Uh, and, and the very depressing statistic was that four out of five people with disabilities don't get the chance to have a, a normal holiday uh, like, uh, like other people. And therefore, I think we've got to work hard uh, with businesses. Because much, much of what we're talking about today is provided by the private sector, by businesses. We have to work hard with them to make sure we have accessible accommodation, uh, accessible travel, hospitality, retail, and, of course, tourist attractions. Now, in my own area in, in Mid-Scotland and Fife, there's a number of facilities that have a, achieved top marks for accessibility in uh, Ewan's Guide, the Ewan's Guide that Jenny Mara uh, referred to. Actually, just before I mention those, I should say that the Scottish Parliament itself has got a very good track record in leading from the front in, in Ewan's Guide, uh, the website that collates reviews and scores from disabled people on the accessibility of tourist attractions and other sites. The Parliament gets a score of five out of five. So well done to Mr. MacArthur, who's on the corporate body uh, for his efforts in that respect. But, go, go, but going back to, to, to my region, just a couple of examples um, uh, came to my attention. There's uh, Tolkien Farm Lodges near Glenamond, which is a five-star uh, rated facility with specialist facilities and resp for respite breaks for the disabled. And their services include round-the-clock care staff, meal provision, and the opportunity to go out on expert-led outings and excursions. In Fife, MND Scotland have invested in an accessible, friendly caravan, which helps provide a safe environment for those with limited mobility. And both of these examples demonstrate the importance of new surroundings in improving the outlook and quality of life for those with disability. And Visit Scotland has done a good job, as the Minister acknowledged at the start, trying to equip businesses with the tools they need, and so far have signed up over 600 businesses to their accessible tourism online training tool. So we're making uh, good strides, but as we've heard, and, and Stuart Stevenson uh, made this point very well, there's much more uh, that can uh, be done, and we need to do what we can to encourage the private sector to step forward. I'd like to pick up a few of the points made uh, in the debate by different uh, members. There was a lot said about transport. Um, the, um, the, 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 the transport probably most used by people with disability is, in fact, the private car. And here we've come on leaps and bounds in, in recent years. If you go to virtually any facility with car parking, whether that's a tourist attraction or, a, or a, a restaurant, you'll find a provision of disabled spaces, usually right beside the main door. And that's something that's emerged over recent years and is very welcome. When it comes to public transport, I think the challenges are greater. Rob Gibson talked about... Um, yes, of course. Ennis Robertson. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, with regard to, uh, obviously, blue band spaces, Mr Fraser, I'm sure, is aware 
that many of these spaces are actually taken up by cars and, uh, that don't have blue badges. And I think I'd be asking hotels, restaurateurs, etc., to actually police this more readily than they do. Fraser? Yes, indeed. And I'm sure we, 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 we're familiar with Mr Robertson's work and, and his, his bill in this area. But, of course, when you're dealing with private land, that's a different matter altogether. And that's where I think you do need the, uh, the owners of the facility to, to police that. And I think that's a, a well-made point. Um, the point I was going to make about buses, I think there's an issue with buses, particularly in rural areas. Um, in relation to trains, um, Jake Brodie referred to First Scott Rail's uh, record on um, uh, booking uh, travel assistance in advance, where they reduced the time required from 24 hours to four hours, which is an important step forward, but there's more could be done. In terms of stations, we've just seen the new Glen Eagles station uh, opened. Uh, those attending the Ryder Cup will, will be making uh, use of that, and that is uh, very uh, uh, friendly towards those with disability, with new lifts and so on put in. And a number of members, Jenny Maran and, and Annette Milne and others, referred to the problem with Waverley Station, where I think there is a genuine issue here with uh, the removal of vehicular access to the heart of the station where it was before, where it always seemed to me it didn't seem to be a particular issue with having, having taxis there. Um, we also saw, quite apart from the issue of, of access, uh, for people with disability, we saw during the festival tourists having to queue outside in the rain, often for a long time to get taxis, whereas previously they would be inside and undercover. So I would urge the Minister to do what he can to, to uh, um, engage with Network Rail uh, and with Waverley Station Management to see that anything could be done to improve that particular issue. And Nigel Dawn made, made a, I thought, some uh, uh, very uh, thoughtful uh, comments about uh, uh, transport more generally. Patricia Ferguson talked about heritage. Um, I think we need to recognise we're dealing with historic Scotland. There are some buildings that simply cannot be adapted because to do so they would lose their uh, uh, historic uh, nature. Um, but there is a lot being done, and, and I was interested to hear with her, her comments about access statements and the, uh, uh, the benefit that these uh, provide. Jamie Hepburn uh, and, and Mark MacDonald mentioned the issue of public toilets, and this is actually, I think, a very important subject. And public toilets are important not just for people with disabilities, but people uh, who are elderly or those, as I'm sure the Minister knows, with young children. Um, what we've seen over the last two decades in Scotland is a, a, a serious reduction in the availability of public toilets. Now, we were in, in the summer on holiday in Northern Ireland, um, and it struck me we, when we were staying in, in Port Rush, which is a very small seaside town, that the provision of public toilets there was far and above what you'd have got in an equivalent um, town in Scotland, and they were accessible, and they were clean, and they were well maintained. Now, we know that the level of public spending in Northern Ireland is higher than it is in Scotland, but I think there is a real issue here about if we're trying to make Scotland a, an attractive place to visit, not just for those with disabilities, but for everybody, including families and the elderly, we need to look again at toilet provision. And a lot of uh, councils have gone down the road of comfort schemes where they're having a uh, uh, a relationship with a, a local provider. Often what happens is the, the shop or the hotel or the, 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 the bar or restaurant providing the, 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 the toilets that will then close or change and there's no alternative facility available. So I do think in terms of tourism we need to look at that. Finally, I can see you're waving at me, Deputy Presiding Officer. I just mentioned the question of attitudes which is very important because uh, we know that hostile, inappropriate or patronising behaviour from those uh, providing services to those with disabilities uh, is very off-putting and detrimental. So can I just say in closing, Deputy Presiding Officer, Must, four, going back to the Minister's point, four out of five people with disabilities do not enjoy a holiday. That's not acceptable. We have to change that. And I support uh, the motion and Jenny Mara's amendment. Thank you. Thanks so much. Now call on Jenny Mara, just about eight and a half minutes, slightly less. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I've enjoyed this debate uh, immensely this afternoon. I think, like most colleagues, I've enjoyed the change of pace and tone from, from the last few weeks, but also such an, important, uh, such an important issue for us to discuss in Parliament this afternoon, especially in this year of increased tourism to Scotland and all these incredible events that we are witnessing in our country and all the visitors that they are bringing. So I'd like to reflect, if I can, presiding officer, on the contributions this afternoon, because I think 
there were three particularly substantive points that were raised in this debate that I would like to go over. Um, I'd firstly like to turn to Stuart Stevenson's uh, contribution um, and have to say it's the speech I've enjoyed most in this Parliament of uh, Mr Stevenson's because he uh, started by saying that we've all been particularly unambitious and I have to say to him I, I started uh, listening to his speech by agreeing with him that we've kind of been mulling over um, advances made until now but of course I think actually everyone in this chamber would share his ambition on this but as I was reflecting on some of the issues we uh, raised such as Rob Gibson um, raised the issue of updating the ferry fleet. I mean, I think we would all recognise across the chamber that these are all um, advances we're making within the constraints of, of public spending as well. And I'm sure the minister would be the first to point that out, that although we would like every uh, ferry, the Calmac ferries, to be fully ac accessible, that, that that will happen in time and, and probably as quickly as it can. So I think it's important to have this debate to remind ourselves that, as I said in my opening statement, that accessibility should always be right at the forefront of planning and management decisions. But I think we are making good, good progress within uh, those constraints. Yes, absolutely. Ian MacArthur. I'm very, very grateful to Jenny Moore. I mean, I listened to, um, with great interest to what Stuart Stevenson had to, to say, and I think the point she makes in relation to ferries is very valid. But I, I recall a, a, an incident not so long ago where um, taxis uh, were required to be wheelchair accessible. Now, for some, that was a practical option, and, and, and we've moved in that direction. For many cabs, however, uh, it was frankly impossible. And the risk is that you choke off those businesses to no benefit of those who are able-bodied or not, um, I, I, and, and, and in a sense, we need to be careful the way, as, as Jenny Mara was saying, how we transition from where we are to where we uh, aspire to be. Thank you. Jenny I Mara. think that's a point very well made, and I thank Liam MacArthur for, for his intervention. Stuart Stevenson also said we will triumph when there are no disabled signs anywhere. I completely agree with that, and that is a mark, as I said in the opening statement, of our aspiration towards equality. But his remarks reminded me of a conversation I had with some young students at Craigie High School in Dundee, and they have uh, a, a, a special uh, facility there for, for, for deaf students. And they were telling me about some of the daily barriers they face in everyday life, uh, such as ordering their food in McDonald's, such as getting a Saturday job, and such as getting their way around the city. And one of the things they said to me that really struck with me was this issue about buses. And that actually they reckoned that, that and some of them were from Eastern Europe and had come to, to live in Scotland, that actually in Latvia, the provision on the buses is better and provision across the European Union because there's much more signage on buses. Now, this has all already been legislated for um, in legislation in Europe and through the Equality Act in Westminster. And actually, I wonder if a lot of the issues we are discussing today, there is actually already pre-existing legislation that actually we just need still to comply with or that we still need to enforce. And I wonder if we can, if the Minister can reflect upon that as well. Nigel Dawn made um, a very thoughtful contribution and raised an issue that's come up in my constituency as well about people who uh, require, require a travelling companion, whether that travelling companion can travel for free on our rail network. And perhaps at this point, Minister, you will allow me to say also that I think we must bear in mind with this that there's always going to be a financial barrier as well. We can have very equal and accessible facilities, but there are going to be financial barriers to allow people of lower incomes to access these as well. So I think Nigel raises a very important point, and I wonder if the Minister could have those discussions with Scott Rail or perhaps look um, towards the next uh, franchise uh, to sort out uh, that problem. I wonder also if the Equality Act 2010, that was one of the last uh, very good pieces of legislation of, of our Labour government, and the public sector equality duty included in that, perhaps already as well, um, would perhaps um, cater for the point that Nigel Dawn is raises, raises, and I wonder if the Scottish Government might explore that too. I thought Patricia Ferguson 
raised a very interesting point about uh, insurance premium for travel and uh, travel ab abroad. And this is another uh, thing that's come up in my constituency as well, because people with disabilities and elderly people do face increased uh, premiums for travel insurance. Absolutely. Stuart uh, Stevens. Just to make the observation that some insurance companies now restrict uh, insurance for foreign travel to people who are under 70. And as someone who's reaching for that shortly, I feel that very keenly. Mara. Yes, I, I think that's absolutely right. Now, we don't have jurisdiction over that in this Parliament. There's probably not even jurisdiction over it in the UK Parliament. But I wonder if this is something that we should all across party discuss with our colleagues in the European Parliament, because I think it's something that the single market on insurance at European level could possibly deal with. And it sounds to me like an issue that could be raised quite legitimately in uh, the European Parliament. I was very struck by Liam MacArthur's uh, personal experiences, like I was by uh, Margaret McDougall's in their own families. And I think actually Liam's, uh, MacArthur's um, contribution raised the, uh, the, the importance of uh, good facilities um, uh, when we are travelling, as did Mark Macdonald's uh, contribution when he told us that Scotland's airports are doing a lot to help people with di disabilities navigate their way through. I didn't know that, and that is uh, very good to hear. I'd like to finish, uh, Presiding Officer, if you will allow me, um, to come back Briefly. to my point about uh, PAMIS and their campaign on the Changing Places uh, toilet facilities. Um, I think this is particularly important. I go back to my point about financial inclusion as well, because not everyone in our community can afford a holiday. We're talking about tourism today, but days out make a real uh, difference to the quality of people's lives. As Patricia Ferguson said, being able to spend that time as a family or with friends and people who don't have access to these facilities, these changing and toilet facilities, that is really restricted to them. I wonder with the news that there is not one, I think Mark Macdonald raised it, not one of these facilities in the New Museum of Scotland, that the Scottish Government could maybe commit today to do an audit of the Changing Places facilities across um, Scotland and see where the gaps are in the tourism industry and indeed in shopping facilities and in other I facilities for day out. I think that now. might be a good step forward from today's, today's debate. Thank you very much. Many thanks. I now call on Fergus Ewing to wind up the debate. On behalf of the Government, Mr Wayne Ewing, you have till five o'clock, please. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Presiding Officer. I've thoroughly enjoyed this debate. I congratulate all members on their contributions, which have been varied, thoughtful, um, replete with examples of experiences from the lives of, uh, of their own families who have a disability or friends or constituents, uh, insightful and extremely helpful. And uh, uh, I will be asking, as I do always, the Scottish Government officials in the a tourism section to study the official report and where a specific response has been sought on a specific point to ensure that I answer it if I do not do so in the next wee while, signing officer, as I'm conscious that perhaps there was around about uh, 100 points put and it's as though I'm in an examination where I've got 10 minutes to answer 100 questions uh, and therefore I suspect I probably won't uh, uh, be able to do all of it, but for example, to take one point, Mark MacDonald asked specifically about provision, uh, facilities in the new Museum of Scotland. I will come back to him on that and equally to other members who have specific points of, of that nature. And I would appreciate it if members feel particularly strongly about any of the particular matters they've raised with me and I fail to answer it uh, uh, in the next uh, nine minutes, then they should please write to me and I will most certainly do that. That is my responsibility. Uh, about matters on which members feel strongly, although perhaps that's a risky strategy since MSPs as a breed <coughs> tend to feel strongly on just about everything. Um, I want to respond in three particular sections where I think there was a number of points raised. Firstly, in relation to the response of the private sector and business, and I mentioned Mark Crotho from the Scottish Tourism Alliance is here today. I had the pleasure of lunch with the executive of the STA earlier this week. The STA, um, who now have over 250 members as opposed to 90 just a short while ago, I think are now the main voice of the private sector in tourism and they've agreed to be a champion 
in promoting accessible tourism. I mentioned earlier that uh, there are 625 businesses registered on the online training programme, with 67 having completed it. But the SDA messaging to the industry is to reach 5,000 businesses. I would also mention bodies such as the Federation of Small Business, who represent a very large number of small bed and breakfast and small establishments, uh, and they too will play uh, a very constructive uh, role. Uh, and I would also point out other opportunities that I think we might want to take in promoting the online training toolkit, such as evidenced in the Wood Commission, suggesting that secondary school pupils of S4, 5 and 6 might be encouraged to complete the online training to better attitudes, because in part, this is about education and about attitudes in society. Just as drink driving was behaviour which became seen as totally unacceptable perhaps a few decades ago, and then just as smoking in, in uh, restaurants and pubs has, in, in the last decade, I think, become something which is regarded as unacceptable, so too, perhaps, behaviour of a sort which is lacking in respect to people with a disability will, I, will too, I suspect, become seen as unacceptable and beyond the pale. So this is partly a matter of social attitudes and partly a matter of effective communication of a training um, programme which has cost relatively little, but I think which has already starting to begin to achieve uh, good things. Um, also involved in the, the, the general section about business in the private sector, Nanette Milne mentioned a, an excellent example of uh, crathy holidays. And I understand uh, that Maggie McAlpine is a member of the Accessible Tourism Steering Group. Uh, and I am informed that in her establishment, they've welcomed over 620 disabled people with 1,400 holidays. 51% of the bookings in 2013 came from people who had previously enjoyed a holiday, repeat business. The reason I refer to this excellent holiday establishment is this. If they have succeeded in providing excellent facilities, that is a sign to many other businesses that there is a, a great business opportunity in doing this. And Crathy holidays are by no means alone in that respect. So I, I, I praise them and potential new establishments like the Ring Farm that was uh, I mentioned, I think, by... Patricia Ferguson, and which I had the pleasure to cut the sod upon recently. And I, Robertson. Take, uh, uh, I will I, take. I, I thank the Minister for, the, uh, for giving me the opportunity of uh, brief intervention. Uh, Minister, uh, I think the point about Crathy opportunities is it's an opportunity for all and not just people with disabilities because their doors are open, although they're fully accessible for people with any disability, they're open for all, and that includes people who have no disability. Minister. I, I'm, I'm glad Dennis has uh, kind of corrected me there. He's absolutely right. And I, I think I may have mentioned earlier that people with a disability will often be accompanied by carers or friends, and sometimes as many as four or five people. And they tend to stay uh, for a longer period. Uh, so I think Dennis is absolutely correct. Now, many members mentioned uh, various issues about rail, and I'm pleased to say that the ScotRail franchise has fairly rigorous new commitments which I think members will welcome, and also the procurement for the Caledonian Sleeper franchise. However, I think I should refer to the, I think, four or five members who referred to Waverley and problems there. And I'm advised that Network Rail continues to engage with disability organisations to address concerns raised as a result of the removal of taxis from inside Waverley Station in June, which was required for security reasons. Now, what I would have to say is this, and it's not my portfolio responsibility, of course, or... I have to choose my words with a measure and degree of uh, care, presiding officer, to uh, uh, avoid getting into certain difficulty here. But members from every party in this chamber raise their concerns about this aspect. I think it would be sad if secu security were, if you like, to triumph over the needs of disability. We would all be sad about that. I don't know the particular criteria concerned, of course, but what I will most certainly do is pass a copy of the official report both to Keith Brown, who's the colleague and minister responsible for this, and Mr. Montgomery, the um, a chief executive of Transport Scotland, and ask that I be provided with an explanation as to whether there is any prospect that improvements can be made for an issue that has been raised, I think, by a great number of members, and I think out of respect to this chamber, 
that is something that it would be appropriate to do. The third area of topics that uh, were raised concern Visit Scotland. And uh, first of all, I'm happy to say to respond to, I think, uh, I think was it Mark Griffin or was it uh, Mark McDonald or Dennis Robertson? Uh, a memory is beginning to fail me here. That the website was not as friendly as it should be with regard to information about accessible tourism. I'm pleased to report that Visit Scotland discussed this matter today, and they are changing the website accordingly to make it more accessible. Um, I did like that phrase of Winston Churchill, action this day. It's not often that I can give a, such, a, such a good example of it having taken place. Chris McCoy is the head of Visit Scotland's Equality and Diversity and is the Accessible Tourism Project Manager. And uh, I, I'm pleased to mention Chris because she has played a blinder in taking forward this agenda. She is recognised in the sector as having given the dynamism and leadership and vision and energy and enthusiasm to this. And as I did remark to her recently, Chris, you make Lawrence of Arabia look like a couch potato. Sorry, Ms. Mather, the minister's in the last as minute. A compliment. Um, I, might, I think I'm in my last minute. I apologise. I, I have to just move to, a, I think, a conclusion, a presiding officer. Um, so, this has been a great debate. Uh, we've covered a, a large number of areas. We've had a lot of positive suggestions. I'm very confident that many of the things we can do so that people with a disability can enjoy a holiday just as the rest of us are not things which necessarily involve huge expenditure of money, taxpayers or otherwise, but simply involve all of us treating people with a disability in the same way that we treat everybody else, as Stuart Stevenson and Dennis Robertson urged us to do, with courtesy, respect, uh, friendliness and regard to their particular considerations. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Ewing. That ends the debate on accessible tourism. Can I just take this opportunity to thank the BSL interpreters and the palantypist who have assisted us throughout the day. We are most grateful to you. The next... The next item of business is consideration of motion number 10987 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on causal membership for the Committee of the Regions. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion. Moved. The question on this motion will be put at decision time to which we now come. There are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 10988.1 in the name of Jenny Mara, which seeks to amend motion number 10988 in the name of Fergus Ewing on accessible tourism be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 10988 in the name of Fergus Ewing as amended on accessible tourism be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion as amended is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 10987 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on causal membership for the Committee of the Regions be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time and I close this meeting and this week.